welcome to another edition of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles. And for shits and giggles, just to have some fun, um, when we do a show, uh, lately I've been dropping these like instantly once the show is over. I go, before when I was in my other place, I would go to a different room and I'd go uh, drop the audio and and record this on a different computer. But now that I have to do everything on the same unit, I thought to myself, you know what would be really cool since we, we have discussions after show. Sometimes we have discussions after show damn near as long as the show. So while I have my co-host here with me and I'm on the same unit, I was like, you know what, guys, let's keep the conversation going for a few minutes and get people ready for the show that we have today with what you're going to be hearing is the audio from our Saturday-only free show with Dr. Haroon Yilmaz. And we got into the weeds on the Russian Revolution and the national question. So here with me for a change are the Saturday crew. Jean Bajlan, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Marcus from the Left Flank Vets, can you hear me? What's up, what's up, what's up? Pascal Robert, can you hear me? I'm right here. Can you talk about... Real quick, you guys, what you thought of the show today? The show today was important because we talked about the history of the socialist the so, the so Soviet Union's revolution and the Russian Revolution and its impact on the world, but a more prevalent question that was asked by Marxists is that what is the contemporary value of studying the Russian Revolution or the Haitian Revolution or the French Revolution? And the point that I was making to him is that even though we're stuck in a moment where we're even just begging to get democratic socialist reform, my argument is that if we actually had a cadre or left that was revolutionary socialist, it would so scare the ruling class that it would force them to capitulate to democratic socialist reform. And I would argue that the reason why the left is so ineffective is that it's not radical like the, the communists and socialists of the 20s and 30s that forced FDR to go with the New Deal. So my position is that the, the value of understanding revolutionary socialist history is that it gives you a radicalizing paradigm to put yourself in a position where you can actually adjust your politics to make the kind of political action necessary to force the capitalist ruling class and the bourgeoisie to make the concessions to change the function of capital. What's that's pretty... <laughs> That's, that's that's pretty uh, uh, encompassing, Pascal. I think it was a great, I think it was a great show today. I think it is important to discuss the history of the Soviet Union. I think we have to counter both some of the, uh, you know, just anti-communist fabrications, the desire to paint the Soviet Union as a, a an evil regime, but at the same time, and you know, sometimes people disagree with me, with me on this on the left. I think we also have to be honest about the failures of that project as well. And I think learning the history of socialism, learning, you know, the history of warts and all is an important part of political education. Does that mean I think that, you know, if you just read Lenin enough, you'll know what to do? No, I don't <laughs> think we can necessarily apply the political praxis that someone like Lenin developed within the context of an early 20th century semi-feudal autocracy to the United States today. But I think there is wisdom and there is, you know, a use in understanding that, understanding the problems that revolutions failed, uh, uh, you know, revolutions faced, how they can go wrong, what their achievements can, uh, what their achievements can be. So I think we can have a nuanced discussion, which I often don't see amongst uh, people on the left. You're either 100% against the Soviet Union because it was evil or you were 100% behind everything the Soviet Union did yeah. uh, because, you know, America bad. I think we can have a nuanced discussion. And I think overall, and I made this argument at the end of the show, and I think Pascal will agree, whatever the faults of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the emergence of a post-Soviet sphere in Eurasia has been ultimately a negative impact on global affairs. I don't think we would have seen the neoliberal 
pushed to the same extent as we have had it not for been the fall of the Soviet Union. And I don't think we would have th seen things like the, the, the war on terror and the enormous human cost that has had if, it had a, if the Soviet Union had still been in existence. And I think uh, what you're going to end up hearing is that uh, Pascal's a tanky, she's a trot. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. But I don't want to, like, and obviously I don't want to simplify things. And also I don't want to, like, I would, I'm going to push back a little bit on Pascal because I didn't want to see him asking, like, what's the importance of talking about revolutionary history? I think that there has become, yeah, a prevalence just to have the argument over is Stalin cool, yes or no? Um, and it just led to, you know, a lot of sectarian uh, I believe like belief systems or organizations, none of us, none of us, obviously that, that, that like fall into uh, that category. Um, but I think for me, I, what I'd love to, I think, you know, we eventually get to this point of what does those, those actual situations, those decisions, um, and especially to when they're like, we're talking about call uh, the cultural uh, narratives that were, uh, that would be, I guess, uh, cultivated, I guess, say, the, um, by the Soviet Union or by the USSR on different regions. How can that play into effect, you know, with the left, the U.S. left now, and you know, and or at least the the group of people who call themselves leftists in the United States? Um, so I guess that, yeah, that's 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 my take on it. Is that like the, this whole you know tanky versus trot thing? It's so um, we shit. just need to. We need to dead that shit, and then and and, yeah. and and really just interrogate the facts on what they happen and what is that usefulness from the of that specific tactic, um, in the best way that we can understand it in our current world. Well, my position is that be revolutionaries until we get the reforms that we need. There you go. And on that note, that you're about to listen to our episode with Dr. Harun Yilmaz on the Russian Revolution and the National Question. If you haven't done it. Become a patron. Patreon.com backslash this is Revolution Podcast. I'm sorry. <laughs> Patreon.com backslash Bitter Lake Presents. If you want to see this show in real time and participate in the conversation, YouTube.com backslash this is Revolution Podcast. And if you hear that music, I've talked too long and I am out. <laughs>
various black news channels. He was going at it. He was going ham. He was so going so hard on the black news channel that Mark Lamont Hill was afraid to come on here. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that, but he definitely was on the black news channel. He is a man that is not afraid to mouth mouth the bourgeoisie. Please welcome Mr. Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. Jason, I want to let you know that I missed being on the show on Thursday, but I know you did, I know you guys had a wonderful show with you and Gene talking about healthcare. And I also want to let you know I'm very excited for today's show. And I just want to give a brief reminder as to why, because you already know this. For those in the audience who may have forgotten, I have two uncles who left Haiti during the height of the Cold War to go study in the Soviet Union. One went to study physics and the other went to study chemistry. I actually have a Russian Russian cousin who was born in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. I have two cousins who were born in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So I have a particular fondness for Soviet history, the Soviet project coming from a country born as a revolution as well. So I'm looking forward to this show. I mean, he's very prepared. I just want you guys to know that. Me personally, in the back of my dark mind, I think that fool was like, you know what? I got to get these questions ready for Saturday. I'm not even going to show up Thursday. Because Saturday is my day to shine. So he was practicing all his mild mouth questions on the Black News Channel. He was getting ready. So are you ready? Because, you know, the Mau Mau Hour is also this week coming. That's right. We're going to have a great mile mile hour. We're going to be talking about a video that's on YouTube of a civil rights panel after the March on Washington with James Baldwin, Harry Belafonte, and a few other Hollywood uh, bigwigs and, uh, and uh, Sidney Poitier talking about their thoughts on the March on Washington. So if you guys want to be a part of this discussion and you want to ask Pascal questions in real time, make comments in real time, there's one way to do it. And that is become a patron patreon.com backslash bitter lake presents. And wherever you're watching this show, there are links in the description. That being said, he was once the black man in Maine. Now he is just another brown drop in Chocolate City. He is Marcus of the Left Flank Pets. Yo, 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 yo. Well, and that's the thing. Black Iovelli has to be close to power um, to be able to, you know, give the nuance and explanations. So let's get our uh, no, no, yo, no, no, no votes, no yes votes. Just gonna sit that? on the sidelines and uh, just stay happy to be here. He and and also we can't forget uh, the host of a new gaming show. You can't see behind me, but there's like gaming shit everywhere. This is actually the place where I learned about role play gaming. People that own this place actually taught me a lot about that that whole world. But great inaugural episode with friend of show friend in real life dan larson he's everyone's favorite professor in the heartland he's bringing leftist thought to one of the reddest parts of america he is mean gene bajlon good morning gentlemen good morning pascal good morning marcus and of course Good morning, Jason Myers. So the crew is all here. Are you guys so cool. excited for this show? I am. I, I will say this in Pascal. I, I wouldn't say defense of Pascal, but kind of to his point about this show being pretty good. We had agreed um, about a month or so ago that I wasn't going to make any more intro clips for the weekends because it just takes up too much time. And there's other actually projects um, that I'm supposed to be doing. Situation is making it a little more difficult. 
And um, I wanted to make one for this show as I was putting, you know, setting everything up and getting the events already. I was like, oh, I should do one for this. It's like, no, 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 I don't, I fucking don't have time. I'm going to go down the dark, dark rabbit hole. So I'm excited for this show as well because I know, I know uh, once we get rocking on this, this chat is going to fucking blow, <laughs> blow the hell up. You know, sadly, we should have got a, a our other good friend and friend of show, uh, Professor Asatar Bear on this one. This one would have probably went for like three hours if we would have got Dr. Bear on. I don't know what's going to be so long about this. You, you don't, how much I don't, do you know about the Russian Revolution? I don't, I don't understand. I mean, like from what I see on Twitter, Stalin was a pretty good guy. You know, <laughs> dude, the dude, U.S. <laughs> the U.S. talked a little trash, but he was a pretty decent guy. And you know, that's it. You know, go back to you know, the keys of also a smoke show or young Stalin. So like, I don't, I don't know what's so controversial about the topic, but uh, I, I'm open. You know, I'm open to you know. So Soviet Union history and re the Re Russian Revolution is more than just Stalin. I I am aware. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just know, being facetious. Fascinating subject matter. One of the most important revolutions in the history of the world. I'm telling you, Pascal, Thursday, he was like, I can't show up Thursday because I must be paired. Must be prepared. For Saturday. I would make the argument that the Russian Revolution is more important to the world than the French Revolution. Ooh. I mean, I think both those revolutions both those revolutions are important. But because they they're all part of a broader which, revolution. Which was more liberatory, the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution? Well, they occurred at different times. So it's, you know, at the time, the French Revolution was a progressive revolution. But by the 20th century, the bourgeois revolution had become reactionary. This what is historical materialism, my friend. What countries in the global south got liberated because That's of the French Revolution? We haven't even invited the guests yet. This is what I'm talking about. I told you guys, you don't understand. This it's is gonna why get Thursday, he wasn't here because he was getting prepared. Yeah, he well, let's, let's be denied. Let's bring on the guest, my my dear friend from uh, university. So Dr. Haran Yumaz is a, a regional expert on history, national identities, and political propaganda. His academic and popular publications cover Ukraine, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. He received his master's and PhD from Oxford University. That's that's where he knows Gene, their Oxford alums. Dr. Yilmaz was a research fellow at Harvard University and British Academy. He lectured on Stalinism at Queen Mary University of London. Currently, Dr. Yilmaz is Central Asia Research Forum Series Editor at Rutledge, Taylor, and Francis Group. Is that a good introduction? It's a good introduction. He's also an expert on pickles. That's weird. And I'm mad you know that. Pickles are an important food stuff. For... Stuffing for, your food for sandwiches. No, you can eat pickles uh, <laughs> al fresco. Okay, Bubba Gump. <laughs> <laughs> you can you eat pickles, pickles all day. Pickles. Pickles. You got pickles on the side, pickles let's on top, focus, pickles underneath. Let's, let's, well, let's not focus on Gene's desires to eat phallic symbols. Let's just leave that alone. You're the one talking about pickles being <laughs> phallic symbols. <laughs> <laughs> We're applauding Eugene eating pickles. So the guest. <laughs> please I'm assuming everyone. that they're still here. Please welcome everyone. If he hasn't ran away, <laughs> please welcome Dr. Harun Yilmaz. Well, thank you for thank coming and putting up with us. Thank you for the introduction. I haven't experienced uh, such a great introduction in my life so far, uh, and I'm not 20 years old. So I hope when I open my mouth, I will not be a boring uh, scholar next to your uh, great chat just before me. Oh, no, we do all that to loosen you up so you get ready for some seriousness, some silliness, and some breaking down of history. Um, now, first things first, let's just be honest. People come to watch this show for Pascal's questions. And when Pascal actually takes a day off to prepare for an episode, because I'm not, uh, that's why he was gone. He wasn't tired. He wasn't exhausted. He just wanted to prepare. So I'm going to give the floor. Look at this, Pascal. I'm going to give the floor. 
to you because you are ready. So there you go. You have the floor. I'm going to start with the introductory question for people who are not familiar with the Russian Revolution and the Soviet Union. Dr. Harun, can you please explain to our audience what was the political situation in czarist Russia? The czar was the king, basically, of Russia before the Russian Revolution. What was the political economy of Russia? What was the economic situation? And who were the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks? And why was that even a need? Or what was the situation or conflict that caused a need for a revolution in pre-World War I Russia in the first place? Ah, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, um, uh, uh, it's a it's a very long question. Uh, can be dissected into a couple of questions. Uh, uh, if I forget something, please remind me. Um, um, let me start first uh, to thank you all um, for your time and attention. Um, now, um, what was the political situation before the revolution in Russia? Um, it's an it's an interesting it's an interesting picture because in 1913, just before the First World War, uh, the Romanov dynasty, uh, which was represented by the Tsar Nicholas II, uh, celebrated its 300th year uh, um, ruling uh, Russia as a, as a dynasty, and uh, they uh, organized a grand tour in uh, Russia from one province to another. Um, the royal family traveled to see their subjects, subjects celebra uh, celebrated the occasion, uh, you know, the refreshing their, in a way, um, um, uh, their bond uh, between the subject and the uh, uh, monarch. Uh, and um, you, if you have seen those photographs when they visited the different cities in Russia, you would think that no chance there would be a revolution in Russia. This monarchy is so popular. Everyone loves the uh, Tsar uh, and uh, everyone is for the monarchy. You know, in 1913, just one year before the First World War. Uh, and we have in 1917, not one, but two revolutions uh, in, in Russia. Yes, in uh, three, uh, four years uh, after that. Um, Russia was... Um, in economic sense, of course, uh, um, it it was um, experiencing uh, a path of development, like catching up with the with the British, French, and German uh, um, um, uh, cases. <clears throat> um, of course, Britain and United States were they were leading uh, economies, and then would come. Uh, immediately, uh, Germany and then France and Belgium, etc., Italy and in Europe, in Western Europe. Then we would have uh, kind of a second league of capitalist countries, semi capitalist, as a semi industrialized uh, Austria Hungarian Empire and uh, Russian Empire. Um, so uh, they were in this troubled road of industrialization. But they knew that they were a couple of steps behind. behind. They are lacking. They are, um, they are lacking capital. They are lacking investment. Uh, Ninety percent of the 80, 80 per, more than eighty percent of the population lived in uh, villages. They were illiterate. Um, only fifteen percent were in uh, towns and uh, cities, um, and they most of them. Uh, most of the literate population was, was there. And um, there was a attempt of rapid industrialization, but it was, uh, it was late. And if, if, considering the scale of Russia, uh, um, it was also uh, small. Uh, yet, uh, there were big Western uh, investment, capital investments, like um, in uh, St. Petersburg, uh, one of the biggest uh, ammunition factories uh, in Europe uh, was 
uh, founded by um, Western investors, uh, Donetsk, uh, in now in Ukraine, um, French uh, mining industry invested uh, pr probably in today's um, currencies, in today's values, billions of uh, dollars uh, and coal mines. Uh, they One of the biggest coal mines were there in Europe. So there were there was this um, um, big industrial investments and huge, a big ocean of uh, illiterate peasantry, um, gradual um, internal migration from countryside to those uh, points of attraction. And there is an increasing tension because there were constant and increasing inequalities in the society. Um, big investments brought big changes, transformations in certain spots, certain locations in this huge country. But the rest of the country was, uh, of course, isolated. Um, and um, big landlords um, from the pre feudal system, like they, they uh, of course, had a, a, a pleasant life. Um, most of them lived in St. Petersburg in the capital. Uh, they had their own manners, big houses there, um, and they, they sometimes they would go, you know, in the summer to the to uh, inspect their uh, lands. Um, um, yeah, that was big inequalities, uh, an autocrat uh, ruling um, without sharing as much as possible, without sharing political power with any uh, kind of parliament, political parties. Um, trying to keep the uh, power in his hands. Um, that also created, uh, of course, tension um, because there were uh, people who wanted to reform the uh, political structure. They wanted to have a, a parliament, something similar to um, what they observed in Britain or in France. Um, there were different uh, proponents of political uh, ideologies, in center-left, center-right, um, you know, uh, that you could see at that time in France, in Britain, or in Germany. So, so basically, for our audience, is that Russia was a monarchy with a czar yeah. who was a king in a country that was basically more economically backwards than most of the industrial Europe, which was in some either advanced or moderately advanced form of capitalism, while Russia was largely a feudal, a feudal feudalist peasantry, where you had large numbers of the population, illiterate farmers, who were working on land that was not even their own for feudal landlords like they had in Britain before the coming of capitalism, going back to like the 1200s and 1100s. And one of the reasons Mark, Karl Marx is famously say, known for saying that the last place he believed that it could be a socialist, a communist revolution was in Russia is because there was no proletariat, because it was a peasant, you know, agricultural, feudal uh, peasantry. And people who know their Marxist or socialist history is that it's not to the invention of Maoism that socialists come up with the idea that peasants, farmers can be revolutionaries as well. So at that time, there wasn't even a belief that a country like Russia was even capable of having a Marxist revolution because it did not have an industrial proletarian labor base. Would I be correct in that assessment? Completely correct. Yes, that's the, that was the case. We could say, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But can I, can I just can I just ask though? But you know, you mentioned that there had been a process of industrialization. So certainly, you know, um, the uh, the majority of the mass of the population in Russia. Uh, during the, you know, at the time of the Bolshevik revolution were peasants, 80%, you said, 80% of people. But we do have this situation of uh, combined uneven development where you do, mm. alongside so some of the most backward economic structures in Europe, very advanced form of industrial organization and a small but influential proletarian class. So yes, certainly we're not dealing in a society where we have um, we have a you know a, a majority of the population living in cities and working as industrial workers. but we do have in 
critical nodes of political power in the Tsarist Empire, St. Petersburg, Moscow. We have a modern industrial economy, and in fact, an industrial economy which is hypermodern. It's like they're, they're not importing industrial technology from the mid-1850s. 18, uh, uh, they're in, uh, the, the French in investors, the other investors are bringing the most modern forms of industrial organization. So we have these, this, this, this very strange situation where we have a coexistence between an a, 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 a industrial proletariat that is a minority, but is located in strategically important parts of the country, and then the vast majority of the country, which is peasantry, and you know we'll come to this later, but and also not Russian. You know, you have a huge, you know, maybe only fifty percent of the population are, are, are ethnic Russians, and we have this huge, unconsolidated uh, population. But I, I think it's important to stress that there. The, would you agree there there was, an the 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 great spurt of the late 19th, early 20th century, the great, you know, this did create some kind of industrial proletariat. Yes, of course, of course. I mean, that, that that's the, that's the reason, one of uh, the many reasons of these tensions before the revolution. And one of the reasons was this um, a source of tension was this uh, uh, unequal uh, development in the country. Uh, you would find certain uh, cities or certain regions extremely developed thanks to like injection of uh, um, um, uh, high volume of capital, let's say, in, in St. Petersburg, uh, as I gave this putil of uh, uh, ammunition Still factories, yeah. the yeah. Uh, big, biggest ones. And uh, and also steelworks, yes, and uh, and uh, uh, coal mines in uh, in Donetsk. Um, you know, uh, Odessa, for instance, was a, a modern, um, pleasant uh, port city, uh, uh, a modern city. You, that was the uh, a big port at the K K Black Sea coast. So, um, but then uh, the rest of the country. In a way, experiencing a, a different century, <laughs> a different time time zone. Yeah, but that was ninety percent of the population. I mean, the industrial sector was basically I went, they weren't petite bourgeois in that they didn't own means of production, but they were minuscule compared to the, the condition of the majority of the population co co completely. That was I wouldn't even call them a proletariat. They were basically people working in a small sector factory development that was fun basically. You know, maintaining cities. cities. Well, I, I would, I would push back. They, they were the, they were an industrial proletariat, and yes, they were a minority of, you know, in an objective term, they were an industrial proletariat, uh, living in a very regimented industrial formation within these huge factories. But yeah, they were a minority. But I think what is critical, and perhaps Harun can speak to this, is that they were located at the, they, they existed right next to the critical nodes of power. Such as the, yeah, the, the capital, yeah, the in the capital. So I, you know, just because they're a minority doesn't mean they're a, not a proletariat. You know, I, I don't yeah, see but they don't they represent less than like fifteen percent of the whole country. That's true, but under a Marxist, I mean, yes, and under a Marxist scheme, uh, you know, like a dictatorship of the proletariat is usually envisaged as a dictatorship of the majority of the population. But, you know, under Russian conditions, you know, a dictatorship of the proletariat would be a dictatorship of a minority group. Hence why Marx would have said that Russia was not the place where we're going to see a, 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 you know, a, a socialist revolution. Well, not only Marx said, but um, after Black the enough. revolution, Kautsky also uh, said that you are in the wrong direction because uh, you are not the right country to do this. You do not have enough uh, economic base uh, for this transformation. You will end up with just a, a naked uh, dictatorship instead of a dictatorship of proletariat. I mean, the Kautsky, who, you know, the uh, leading figure of German uh, so Social socialists and assistant of Engels and so on. Um, Let's not forget that even many of the earlier uh, leaders of the Russian Revolution believed that the revolution would, would be global because Germany would follow suit with the, the Marxist revolution because Karl Marx was German. Actually, the, the place that he thought that it would be ideal for the Marxist revolution would be Germany. 
So, but, but I think I think the point I think the point though is that you know the Bolsheviks when they took power, as you rightly note, saw their revolution, and there was some basis of this in Marx's writings. But they saw their revolution as the basis for a, a, a global revolution, and did not envisage did not envisage the revolution failing to spread westward. The warnings that had been given by people like Plekhanov was that, it, and Plekhanov, if for people who don't know, was one of the founders of uh, Russian Marxism, was that if there is a re revolution in Russia and Russia is isolated, you will have the socialists in power uh, doing, you know, doing industrialization, uh, bringing all the brutality that comes with industrialization, Incan industrialization, and then getting the blame for for like the harsh conditions that drag the country from uh, from uh, pre-industrial to industrial situation. My goal here is not to indict the Soviet project. I'm an admirer well, of the Soviet project. Me, what, makes me, me. what makes me admire the Soviet project is that I believe it succeeded in light of the fact that it didn't have what most orthodox Marxists believed would be necessary to be successful. Hold well, on, uh, Christina. Hold on, Gene. Hold on. Let me sure. address the super chat before you guys go back and forth. I warned you people that this was going to be a spicy show. <laughs> and now you're seeing why it's going to be so spicy. Did it's the, thank you, uh, Mitty Doctors, for this super chat coming out of Great Britain. Gene, this is a countryman right here. Did the peasants have revolutionary potential? Harun. Um, I I wouldn't think so. Um, um, why? Uh, because uh, revolution happened uh, when uh, multiple things uh, overlapped at one point. You see, uh, usually hi historical events are not uh, like from A to B, from and then from B to C. But then there are three, four uh, factors overlap, and then you have a. Uh, kind of an explosion. <laughs> um, so, um, first of all, um, we mentioned about these uh, tensions, uh, um, different levels of development in, in the same country. Um, uh, while there is a rapid development at one corner, uh, the majority is uh, uh, lacking this. And then, but uh, I should add that um, actually millions were gradually uh, being integrated, but slowly. You see, uh, for instance, I will just give you a, a quick example. Uh, tea, uh, usually Russian villagers would not consume tea and sugar uh, before 19th century. But as by the end of the 19th century, railways, uh, railway connections established between big cities, especially in European Russia, uh, they brought tea and sugar uh, to um, countries, to the countryside. So even the villagers' consumption uh, gradually transformed. But these things are uh, these things happened in a very slow motion, uh, in a very gradual manner. While in in in, for instance, as I said, in Donetsk or in uh, Petersburg, there was a huge leap forward. Now, uh, those uh, new proletariat in those uh, cities uh, who just who happened to be like a year ago or six months before that, uh, a serf in a in a big landlord's. Um, uh, estate, um, they continue to keep uh, the connection between the countryside and urban the uh, urban uh, life. Like it wasn't a, a second or third generation uh, urban dwellers or factory workers. They were still in a transition state. Sometimes also radicalization uh, can be a, a consequence of this. Um, another aspect is political system, um, just I'm trying to recap things we discussed, political system uh, was very rigid. Um, there wasn't any, um, um, uh, you know, channels to express dissent. Um, political parties uh, most of the time uh, banned or they had limited uh, freedoms. Um, as, uh, even after 1905 uh, revolution and the Russian Duma uh, that was uh, created after that, established after that, founded after that, had Can limited I... powers. Um, so uh, going back to uh, peasants' issue, um, and the third factor is the war itself. 
the First World War uh, generated a huge burden on the Russian economic system and in political system. Uh, and Russian, in one word, in one sentence, probably, Russia could not cope with this pressure uh, because this was a total war. Uh, perhaps American Civil War is the early example of this uh, industrial war, uh, but uh, in U Europe experience that scale of war, uh, industrial scale um, during the First World War, and uh, Russia was the weakest link uh, among the capitalist sy system there. So that's why, uh, in a way, war... Uh, probably, if you think about this retrospectively, about all these factors, economic factors, political factors, and so on, um, war was the uh, catalyzing element. You know, the, the, there was a there was a threshold, uh, there was a boiling point. Uh, the country reached to that boiling point uh, thanks to the war. Otherwise, that's why I mentioned earlier uh, 1913 celebrations, 300 years uh, anniversary of. Uh, um, Romanov dynasty, uh, <clears throat> uh, people were very happy to celebrate it. Uh, you know, uh, but right one year after that, uh, the war burden, uh, inflation rates, uh, hundreds of uh, persons, like uh, 300, 400 percent, um, the bread prices uh, skyrocketing, uh, millions of Russian peasant soldiers uh, literally perishing at the German front because the German industry, German railways, German uh, technology, German warfare, uh, constantly beating the Russian army. Russians only had manpower in a way, uh, pushing another couple of millions of peasant soldiers with rifles uh, to the front line. Uh, when they are perished, another few million again. And this, of course, created a huge discontent. Um, and the prices are going up. Uh, the, um, long queues in the cities. Petersburg, although Russia was one of the biggest coal producers at that time, Petersburg could not get the coal from the Black Sea coast, uh, Black Sea region, Donetsk, because of the weak transportation system. Petersburg usually uh, got its uh, imported its coal consumption, and you know, urban uh, buildings could be uh, for the heating of these buildings in Petersburg. They would bring coal from Britain overseas. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like transporting the coal all the way from Britain was cheaper than bringing their own coal, transporting it from um, Donetsk. And during the war, uh, when the railway system nearly collapsed because the front line constantly demanded the locomotives, wagons, and so on, uh, they could not uh, transport coal within the country to the big cities. And people start to freeze in the middle of Russian winter. So uh, all these things overlapped, came together, and we had a kind of an explosion in, um, uh, in February 1917. So villagers alone... Um, could not be uh, the only factor that would lead us to a revolution. Because there was an uprising already in 1916 in Central Asia, and it was suppressed successfully. So there could be another villager uprising, and it could be again suppressed. I mean, the, the, in peaceful conditions, the regime had the capacity to control uh, more or less the population and uh, regenerate itself. I want to the ask two, created extra burdens. I wanted to ask two very important questions. Wasn't it considered that Tsar Nicholas, basically because of the way he came into power, was going to be weak? Wasn't it? He basically predicted to be a very weak, unsuccessful Tsar in the first place. And second of all, can you talk about how the loss to Japan also helped demoralize the Russian consciousness? as well, and the role that had in weakening the confidence of the country as well under the Tsar's leadership, under I mean, the, Tsar Nicholas. The, the Tsar's uh, personality and his role uh, in shaping the course of events in uh, between like uh, beginning of the century, let's say, first year of 20th century and 1970, that's 17 years if you think about that short period. Um, I mean, there are historians who uh, claim that uh, if we, if Russians had a different czar, then the, everything could be different. 
you know, um, when you look from Marx's perspective, of course, uh, to invest too much in individual characters, um, uh, uh, is something that you uh, you try to avoid because um, uh, what was the uh, I can't now remember the exact phrase, but Marx says. Um, Uh, individuals cannot um, uh, they make decisions uh, but they can they do those this they make those decisions within the conditions that were created before them uh, uh, man makes his own history but conditions not in, in conditions not of his choosing I believe it something like ex- that. Ex- excellent yes so uh, since then there is a discussion in among historians of course uh, uh, when they discuss this I mean when they, uh, when they consider these kind of turning points in history how far individuals uh, had an impact uh, or they were uh shackled they were uh, you know uh, enslaved or limited by uh, the conditions that they live in uh, political con- economic conditions especially so uh, tsar uh, was not a good politician uh, we know that uh, i mean uh, to be a good politician is important if you rule a big country and if you want to jealously keep the political power in your hands and refuse to hand some you know hand over um, uh, part of the political power to a parliament or some political parts to a, to a cabinet of ministries um, he in that sense he was very conservative uh, he was not a, he did not have a reformist mind um, this also increased the problems uh, deteriorated things uh, especially during the war And on top of that, uh, he was probably not the best uh, military leader in history. Uh, and he uh, personally uh, took uh, the initiative and went to the front line and uh, uh, supervised the military uh, operations. Um, and that's why uh, w- uh, when the Russian army uh, was uh, conse- uh, more than once defeated by the Germans, Um, everyone blamed the Tsar, uh, I mean, ordinary people, because he wanted to run the show, but he did not have the capacity to do that. What about the Japan uh, factor? What about? The Japan, Japan. Ah, Jap- yeah, yeah, of course, the 1905, um, the defeat was, uh, what, was, an important, was an important thing, I think, because uh, Russian... Russian state, Russian political system, um, um, autocracy uh, was based on military victories. Uh, and Russian state, uh, except the Crimean defeat uh, for the last 200 years, delivered what it promised, uh, ex- expanded the territory and defeated the um, uh, Napoleonic army, um, you know, uh, in the southern neighbors, the Ottoman Empire, Iran, uh, gain territories uh, in the south as well so and they initial uh, perception of japan was another asiatic uh, people another asiatic country that we can defeat like this you know because we are superior here we rule this eurasian land and who they are you know uh, i mean that you can find even uh, racist depictions of uh, russian cartoons uh, of that time uh, uh, but then uh, the japanese uh, 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 navy uh, and army they managed to defeat uh, the russians uh, and that was of course a, a big i think blow in the self confidence uh, of Uh, the Russians, which which actually between 1905 and 1914 um, triggered another wave of reforms, because the system was so static that uh, in Russia you would see reforms, you would observe reforms always after a military defeat. Um, after the Crimean War, you 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 can observe, for instance, Crimean defeat. emancipation, the emancipation of the peasantry. Exactly, exactly, and and uh, <clears throat> rapid uh, construction of uh, railways and so on mm-hmm. um, uh, in the second half of 19th century, and then after 1905, 1905 defeat against Japan, again another wave of reforms. How can we rapidly develop and industrialize this country? Where can we find the capital? How are we going to solve the capital accumulation problem? Uh, these were all discussed among the. Um, 
uh, elites <clears throat> in Russia before the revolution. And when the Bolsheviks came to power, they found the same problem uh, in front of them. You know, how can we rapidly develop this country and how can we find a, a necessary capital for that yeah how can we accumulate the capital for rapid industrialization and urbanization uh, going kind of even back to like the things in the uh there's like the developing uh <laughs> narrative on the ground of like why they you know like kind of went to um the revolution can you go into some of like the players um and i and, I, and also if you could tie them to like what I guess what are the specific actions or and or pushes these you know other players are, are pushing so you know who are the people who are pushing for government reform which you know eventually resulted in you know i think uh a neutered duma duma to begin with um and then talking about the rigid you know like you're talking about the the rigid uh uh government process or rigid politics like, mm -hmm. But also, it's like, who who are the people behind that, you know, and I guess who are the populations representing those reforms versus the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks? And how do those, I guess, different groups start act, acting group. on each other prior to revolution? Uh, I see that that also we can link to the uh, the other half of Pascal's question. I I, uh, I did not cover the, who were the Mensheviks, Bolsheviks, and uh uh, what was that about? Um, now, <clears throat> um, of course, when we when we uh, when we think about these um, ideologies, political movements, and so on, uh, we tend to think um, um, uh, sometimes uh, we tend to think that the whole country is involved. <laughs> Um, that's a that's a very modern concept, you know. Uh, uh, millions of people involved in in politics. Um, that's a very modern concept. Uh, Russia in uh, in the beginning of the century, before the revolution, uh, was a very traditional uh, country in that sense. Uh, what I mean by this. Um, as I said, majority of the population was, they were villagers, they were more <clears throat> passive agents, they were isolated, they were not part of a bigger economic structure. So um, uh, they would, they had a vague perception of what's going on. Okay, there was a czar, and that was our father. We obey him. And there is a church, and there is a priest in that Orthodox church, and this is the right belief, and we pray there. And, and that's it. And the rest of it was village life. You know, uh, uh, my small plot of land, uh, what I'm cultivating, how is the weather going to be? Uh, if I'm going to, uh, I have a daughter, where can I find a good man as a husband for her? You know, like those kind of uh, daily life issues. Uh, but not like, um, hmm, um, what's going to be the future of Russia? We want democracy or we want freedoms. I mean, Ordinary people, isolated villages, in living in uh, in huge distances. I mean, there, there are provinces in Russia as big as France, and only half a million people live there. You see what I mean? And there is no telegraph lines. There is no railroads. Uh, once a while, a passing passenger comes, or a, a postman comes uh, at, at twice a, a month, delivers something, and then goes in muddy roads. In the in the winter, roads are blocked. In the in the spring. Uh, the mud sticky because of sticky mud, uh, you cannot even walk uh, on a, uh, on those roads. You know, like because you you just stick and uh, sang, sing in, <laughs> in that sticky mud. You leave your boots there <laughs> um, in the mud. So uh, that was a, that was a, that was the let's say mental uh, um, uh, map. Uh, of an ordinary person. And then we have a minority of uh, literate, educated people in big cities, uh, 10%, uh, 15%. Some of them even traveled to Europe. They saw uh, what's going on in Paris, in London, in Berlin, rapid industrialization of Germany, how they managed to catch up the, uh, the British, and even sometimes surpassed with their electricity, chemical industry, and so on and a bit of admiration for that, including Bolsheviks. Now, uh, in a political spectrum, we had uh, uh, constitutional uh, Democrats, cadets uh, in Russian. Uh, they wanted a, um, a parliamentary, uh, pl parliamentary parliament plus monarchy. So they wanted British, they wanted the British model in for uh, Russia. They, they were located in center right. 
right? And then we, in the center left, uh, we had uh, Narodniks and uh, social revolutionaries. Um, they had, um, it's a, uh, of course, 19th century um, uh, is a long story, but uh, they, they wanted more uh, like a popular, they were for a popular uprising, a more popular uh, a moment of the ordinary people in politics, um, universal uh, voting rights, um, at least for, for men for that at that time, of course, um, their priority, um, and um, more emancipation uh, and so forth. So, uh, and land distribution. They wanted to uh, distribute land among the peasants. Um, uh, they wanted, to, their priority was uh, land reform. And then we have a, a, a smaller group uh, further in left um, um, who read uh, Marx, Engels, uh, you know, who were who were involved in uh, these discussions um, among socialist circles in Europe, or, or at least familiar with it, and they wanted to. Um, they, they wanted something similar in Russia, but they 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 were not obviously in majority, right? Uh, they were more marginal uh, than these two uh, central uh, political movements, as I said, cadets and uh, social revolutionaries and Narodniks and so on and so forth. And then we have um, in the right wing, we have more conservative groups uh, <clears throat> uh, who... Um, uh, supported the autocracy, uh, one-man rule, um, uh, the, the superiority uh, of Tsar um, and um, uh, omnipresent, omnipotent uh, powers. Uh, and uh, they were very conservative. Um, and um, yeah, uh, they, they um, for them, Russian imperial uh, system and the church came first uh, in the uh, let's say, uh, right-wing conservative circles. So that was the spectrum. Uh, within the Bolsheviks, within the Marxist, uh, Russian Marxists, we have a well-known division between Mensheviks and Bolsheviks uh, because the Russian Social Democrat Workers' Party, uh, essentially, uh, was founded and... Um, uh, I mean, the Marx, Russian Marxist followers, uh, followers of Marx, uh, founded founded the party, and then within that party, uh, we had to to uh, gradually uh, two uh, branches appear. Two, uh, there was a split division: Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. Um, of course, we can also count uh, uh, sometimes Trotsky as a third element. Um, um, uh, that's that's of course uh, uh, detailed party history, um, but um, yeah, um, and they had different approach. Uh, Mensheviks and Bolsheviks had a different approach, as you know. Um, uh, Bolsheviks wanted to have a militant, uh, uh, a small uh, militant revolutionary party, um, and um, like. Um, uh, in a way, um, uh, and um, urgent. In a way, in a more urgency of revolution, they had in they had in their mind. Uh, but the Mensheviks uh, wanted to have a, a mass uh, political party where masses could be members, and um, uh, Mensheviks were more for the uh, gradual um, development of the country. You know, uh, let's pass the usual uh, <clears throat> capitalist sta uh, stages. Uh, let's wait uh, the industrial for the industrialization and urbanization of the uh, of Russian Empire, and uh, gradually we will have bigger cities, bigger middle class, bigger um, 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 labor movement, uh, labor unions, uh, and then. Uh, as in as in as in Western Europe, uh, we will have a a big socialist party uh, with uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of followers. Uh, this will bring us to, uh, in a way, to the next stage uh, in historical development. Mm. Lenin and Lenin led the Bolsheviks. They they said no, we don't uh, we don't want this. We want a shortcut, uh, and we will do this with a, a militant revolutionary group. 
Can, can we make a metaphor between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, the, the Mensheviks being democratic socialists and the Bolsheviks being Marxist-Leninists? <laughs> <laughs> well, I leave it to you. <laughs> I think it's a pretty effective metaphor. What do you think, Gene? Mm, I think I think trying to apply uh, political it's a metaphor, term, it's a metaphor. Uh, trying to apply the metaphor, you're trying to hammer a uh, square uh, shape into a round hole. That's what I think. I just want to say one thing. This is this this is if you guys indulge me, can you? Talk, I have a theory about Lenin. I believe that Lenin's whole motivation stems by the from the fact that his brother was assassinated by the Tsar. Point blank. I, can you address that? Because I think that's a part of his personality that I'd like to people to talk about. And I'd like to put him in concert because he's kind of the father of the Soviet Union as a country. What do you think about that as a motivating factor? And what and where is his role as a Bolshevik? And where was Trotsky in, re, in relation to the Bolshevik and Mensheviks? That's a hell of a question there, Pascal. Damn. <laughs> Good question, actually. Uh, again, this brings us back to the role of the individual uh, in the in a historical process. Uh, well, um, I mean, the personal motivations, of course, psychological motivations of a person, of an individual, to um, uh, to follow a political um, uh, to to to. Maybe, uh, maybe it played a role. Uh, you know, for him to be uh, the thing is, uh, um, this could bring him in different directions. You know, the uh, his uh, his brother's fate. Uh, um, uh, he could be uh, uh, he could oppose the system, but he could be an anarchist. Uh, there were Russian anarchists at that time as well. You see, uh, um, he could oppose the system, uh, and he could be a, a social revolutionary, or um, you know the. Um, but he he has chosen a, a particular ideology, a particular path. Uh, so uh, perhaps in the being rebellious, being uh, in the opposition. Perhaps his childhood, uh, his family experience uh, played a role. Uh, but of course, his choice of ideology or how to oppose the system, uh, what kind of ideology or what kind of course, uh, uh, what kind of plan, project uh, to support, uh, probably that's a later stage, uh, I, would, I would say. So I have a, I have a question uh, here. Yes. So, you know, we, we when we talk about the Russian Revolution, we, you know, we ov obviously we often focus on the class dynamics, the land question, the industrial uh, workers, and so on and so forth. But also, one of the critical questions that was was facing the the the, the opposition in a general sense of the Bolshevik Party in particular was the national question. And particularly the question of ethnic and national diversity within the Tsarist Empire. Not everybody in Tsarist Russia was uh, was an ethnic Russian or a Russian speaker. Even within the Russian ethnic community, there was an enormous amount of regional diversity in terms of culture and in terms of uh, uh, in terms of dialect. And then, of course, you've mentioned places like Central Asia, where you have a majority Muslim population. Uh, you have uh, you have uh, uh, ethnic communities on the uh, uh, in the Baltics with you know Germans with uh, uh, Latvians Lithuanians Poles. You have this enormously diverse empire. So this kind of speaks to it, but you know this speaks to why the national question was so important. But can you can you give us an idea of you know how the Bolsheviks when they took power uh, and in order to maintain power dealt with this pressing question the issue of ethnic and national diversity within the Tsarist empire uh, that's that's a very important aspect actually this nationality issue uh, national question um, 
<clears throat> because um, especially uh, for for Bolsheviks, uh, for the Bolsheviks, uh, to be honest, um, uh, Marxist literature. I mean, what what Marx and Engels wrote was not about nations much. I mean, they they didn't uh, uh, was as, it was a bit uh, something more or less ignored in Marxist theory, uh, national question. I mean, um, because the engine of the history was class struggle. Uh, uh, is class struggle, right? Uh, why to deal with nations? It's just a, a temporary phenomenon. Um, uh, it's it's going to be here and then it will disappear again. Kind of. Uh, in the mid 19th century, I'm talking about. But then um, Bolsheviks uh, took national question very seriously. And uh, that's not because the theory dictated them to do that, but the practice uh, of the time, the, the realities of the day. Uh, the First World War, first of all, uh, showed clearly that national identities are much more stronger uh, in, uh, when it comes to convince, uh, in convincing the masses about who they are. Um, national identities and nationalism uh, had been very powerful in uh, mobilizing people. The, and the socialists in Europe were divided during the war. Uh, the German Socialist uh, Social Democrat Party supported the German war effort, uh, which was a disappointment for many people around Europe, um, uh, progressive, uh, among progressive groups, um, and which was a direct contradiction uh, to, of the, uh, uh, to the Second International's uh, Stuttgart Resolution. So uh, that the socialist parties would oppose the conflict because everyone was uh, uh, thinking about what we are going to do if, we are go if this uh, capitalist system imposes a war upon us, right? So, um, um, uh, but according to the French labor leader, uh, anyone resisting the war might have been shot by uh, French workers rather than the police. So uh, politicians also found uh, a wave of nationalism uh, uh, that they could not, uh, um, I mean, left -wing, socialist politicians uh, that they they could it was that they found it very difficult to uh, limit or um, push back, and then the and most of the uh, I mean the, probably half of the uh, uh, Bolshevik leadership was in Europe. Uh, when the war started. Lenin was in Switzerland. Uh, Trotsky was also abroad. I think he was in uh, New York, or, um, uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, um, Zinoviev was in Europe as well. Um, so, And Stalin, uh, in 1912-13, he came and went back from to Austria-Hungary and then went back again. So um, uh, they, they could observe the power of national identity and nationalism in Europe. Uh, I can go more into detail, uh, but I will just want to move on uh, to another aspect. Um, the, the other aspect is the Russian Civil War. Uh, <clears throat> again, Russian Civil War demonstrated the power of nationalism or national identities. Now, the Russian Civil War usually uh, considered as a a uh, struggle between the Bolsheviks and the white forces who wanted to restore the old regime, right? Uh, mostly monarchies. Uh, but it was at the same time a clash between uh, Russian and non-Russian forces. Uh, in the Caucasus and Central Asia, uh, non-Russian uh, non populations in, in many cases supported the Red Army. Uh, because the they... States. Pardon? The United States supported the White Army. The United States, the United States, the French, the British. It was an exactly. international war to, to fight for socialism. Exactly, uh, but within within the Russian Empire, I mean the the, the or the Russian Republic after the uh, February Revolution and dur during the Civil War, uh, after the October Revolution, uh, many non-Russian ethnicities supported the Bolsheviks because Bolsheviks were fighting against uh, the uh, Tsarist uh, rule, and um, and um, and. Um, uh, uh, because the, they were against the Russian imperial uh, regime. They wanted to change the system 
and the non-Russian minor uh, uh, populations saw it as an opportunity. Ukraine was a bit complicated because there were strong pro- pro-Bolshevik and um, anti-Bolshevik forces in Ukraine. There was a German intervention at some point. Then there was a Polish intervention and at, at a later stage. So there were there are stages in Ukrainian case uh, during the Russian civil war. I mean that, that, that in during that uh, 1918, 1920, three years period. But in the Caucasus, in Northern Caucasus, for instance, Chechens uh, supported Bolsheviks uh, because Lenin uh, said. Uh, we made a mistake as Russians. We made a mistake. Uh, we pushed indigenous people to the mountains and uh, s- uh, settled Russian uh, peasants, Russian colonizers in more fertile uh, lowlands. Uh, and I will reverse this policy. Uh, I will give what you had before. Uh, I, I will give you back what the Russian um, um, imperial administration uh, taken from you. So uh, the same messages were given to Central Asian people uh, and some and, and these uh, some of these promises were uh, fulfilled later on. I mean, they were not on, only uh, remained on paper. And that brings me to the uh, last point. The Bolsheviks promised something new. <clears throat> uh, and these non-Russian supported, uh, non-Russian population supported uh, uh, the Bolshevik cause because Bolshevik program clearly promised uh, cultural rights, a certain level of self-determination, and that was more successful securing the support of the locals than the White Army uh, leadership. Basically, they were uh, imperial generals of the imperial army uh, restoring, wanted to restore the old system, and they only said, we want one and, and uh, uh, you know, um, uh, a single unit Russia uh, uh, as before. Uh, and they didn't recognize the ethnic uh, identities and they did not plan to, gi- they they had no plans to give any kind of autonomy or cultural rights to any non-Russian groups, uh, you know, Jews, Ukrainians, um, Belarusians, Baltic nations, uh, wh- whatever, Armenians, uh, Uzbeks, didn't matter for them. They, they thought Russia belongs to Russians and uh, <laughs> full stop. Uh, so they did not have anything to uh, promise to the non-Russians. Mm. And I, I so, wanna, yeah. We, we had a super chat that I wanted to address. It's very important. The person asked, what was the, how did the czar's anti-Semitism affect the development of the revolution? And I want to say, I'm very glad that we have you, uh, Dr. Harwon, because most Americans don't know. I, my my admiration for the Russian Revolution, and I wanted to get more to the revolution, is that even though the revolution part, the October Revolution and February, they were nonviolent. There was basically no fighting. And people had this conception of the Rev- Russian Revolution because of the, the pictures and the images of having this whole big violence. There was really no violence involved, per se. But what is the most important to me about this history, even though it's called the Russian Civil War, is where the real honor of the Soviet project comes is that most Americans don't know that the United States sent something like almost 10,000 troops to defeat the Soviet project. The British, the French sent thousands of troops at the beginning of the Soviet Union project with their (laughs) white army to come together to crush this earlier project with Lenin as the leader and Trotsky going all over during the Russian Civil War and destroying these imperialist capitalists and making the Soviet Union the victor. Most Americans have no knowledge of this history. Yeah, correct. Yeah, that's that's true. Unfortunately, uh, that's one of the bits of history that uh, less talked about. Uh, American troops landed, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, in the Vladivostok. Uh, and Arhangelsk, I think, in the north. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, Japanese troops landed in uh, Far Vladivostok. East in Vladivostok. Uh, French and Ger- British troops landed in Odessa and Black Sea coast uh, to support the white forces. Uh, and they also supported uh, um, the, um, was it the Germans supported later on, um, the fin- Finns, uh, Finnish, mm-hmm. uh, the Bourgeois Finnish Republic, uh, fin- um, uh, in today's Finland and so on. So um, they supported um, all kind of uh, 
uh, movements as well. Uh, where, whatever they are, whatever they found an anti-Bolshevik uh, group, they supported. And uh, the, the fact, the fact is, uh, those uh, white armies were a very uh, anti-Semitic discourse as well. Um, uh, they they depicted uh, the Bolsheviks as a par- part of a Jewish conspiracy. Uh, because of Trotsky, uh, uh, because, I mean, the Trotsky uh, is being, be, for being a, a Russian Jew, uh, also, uh, they played with that. Um, uh, that you, probably you have seen on the internet as well, those prominent, infamous uh, po- posters, uh, Trotsky um, depicted as a, like a, a Jewish monster um, suffocating mm-hmm. Russia, uh, Mother Russia, or something like that. So they they had a very anti-Semitic uh, discourse. The white Rush, white uh, forces. Well, one thing I want to say, and I, I know what brothers indulge me, is that one of the reasons why I love the Russian Revolution and the history of the Soviet Union, Soviet Union overall, is that I've said this before. I've said it on social media. I said that the Russian Revolution is the Haitian Revolution for white people. That's I see the Haitian Republic. Yeah. I, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> I can see a connection there. And now I understand why you asked at the beginning uh, uh, which which revolutions were more emancipating for yeah. in global sense, uh, French or Russian revolution. That was I awful. mean, actually, yeah. after, after the, you know, at the end of the day, when we look at the Atlantic revolutions as a whole, which we could include the American, the Haitian, the uh, French revolutions, the Haitian revolution is clearly the most radical of those revolutions. But, you know, I, I, I don't think you can do a one to one comparison between like the impact of the French and the Russian revolution, because they build off each other with no French revolution. There may not have been a Russian revolution, you know, because, mm-hmm. you know, when the when the Russian when revolutionaries in the 19th century looked towards revolutionary praxis, Harun knows within the context of the Ottoman Empire, it's the same thing. The 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 Jean Turklar, the Young Turks were founded on when? 1889. Why? Because that was the centenary of the French Revolution. So the French Revolution, for all its deficiencies, was critical in the development of opening up Europe to capitalism, which in again, which uh, eventually opened up Europe to you know further developments. But I want to actually get back to a a, a you know a uh, a question about this net you know about the national question so you outlined harun about how the you know many minorities within the the czarist empire looked to the bolsheviks because they had they had a solution to the uh, national question which was beyond just like forcing everyone to speak russian and uh, converting everyone to you know orthodox christianity mm-hmm. so i have a two part question uh, one of them is is kind of general And one of them is more specific. The first question is how, once the Bolsheviks had secured themselves in power, how did they go about implementing their resolution to the national question? And secondly, this is a kind of a a more specific one. With regards to the Muslim portions of the Tsarist Empire, and people forget we have very important Muslim portions of the Tsarist Empire in Central Asia and the Caucasus in particular, but also in places like Tataristan, Bashkiristan, and places like uh, places like that. How was the reception amongst Muslims towards the formation of a communist regime? Hmm. So this is a kind of two-part question. Um... Um, now um, let me say a few things. Thank you very much. The, um, um, about this, um, um, before I think before I forget the the Haitian re- revolution, revolution in Haiti. Uh, I think there was a Soviet project to uh, to, um, to 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 do a movie about this, uh, but I, I might be mistaken. I should check it out, and I can send you if I found something interesting. I can find you later on the details. Uh, there's a, just a side note, uh, uh, footnote I wanted to add there. Now uh, going back to uh, na- nations. Um, um, First of all, I want to say a few words about how Bolsheviks saw uh, 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 nations and nationalism, right? Uh, because they understood that this is something important and they cannot uh, reverse the uh, his- river of history. Uh, uh, they, they, they should 
uh, they should find kind of an uh, accommodating uh, position. Uh, they cannot ignore it, but what to do with it? Right, because they they saw uh, essentially they saw nationalism as uh, how a Marxist or internationalist would see it. For them, it was a false call of emancipation. Right, uh, let's start from there. Uh, it was a divisive and destructive ideology working uh, or discourse working against a united internationalist working class revolution. So that's why they didn't they didn't like it. But they understood, for the reasons that I tried to explain earlier, they understood that this is a huge force, that uh, the contemporary reality that they cannot avoid. So they had to do something. So um, uh, the second thing is Bolsheviks were, uh, they saw national identities, uh, uh, they didn't see them uh, pr primordial or eternal as nationalists or nation builder, builders uh, claimed around the globe, right? Uh, for the Bolsheviks, nation, national identities were not uh, primordial or eternal. Um, uh, so they were right uh, on that. Uh, national identities were e evolving phenomena and they were modern concepts. Um, so everyone uh, in the Bolshevik party <laughs> agreed on that. But then the thing is, Bolsheviks were wrong. They were wrong in uh, attaching national identity strictly to economic relations of capitalist era. You know, this, this strong economic determinism made them falsely conclude that nations would disappear, national identities would disappear once the society moved from capitalism to socialism. And, uh, and, uh, um, and then the, the only thing they had to do is just to reach to that uh, magical moment, in a way, uh, so that national identities would uh, evaporate. Mm. Um, so yeah, I can give you one uh, interesting example. Uh, when Khrushchev was the first secretary um, after Stalin, and uh, when they uh, stopped celebrating Stalin's birthday and um, that, that anniversary uh, during this destalinization period, some Georgians took it as an offensive policy against Georgian identity because some Georgians saw Stalin as a Georgian leader uh, apart from being a Soviet leader. So there were demonstrations and protests. Uh, uh, you see what I mean? The Georgians on the street in Tbilisi protesting um, uh, uh, against the Soviet government in nineteen second half of 1950s, uh, um, why we are not, uh, why the government is trying us to forget Stalin, uh, because they saw it, those, that group, that group uh, in the population saw Stalin as a Georgian leader uh, first, and then mm -hmm. Soviet and socialist leader, leader, leader as a second. So, uh, <clears throat> and Khrushchev in Moscow in Central Committee, he 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 complains. Uh, I, 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 when I read the uh, minutes of the meeting, I, it was, I, I smiled, of course. Uh, he says, "Why this happens? Why Georgians are uh, 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 they had this anti-Soviet attitudes? Why they have this Georgian nationalism now? Uh, we built." car factories, we built steel mills, we built, uh, I don't know, cement factories, we built, so in, in one word, he wants to say, we industrialized Georgia, you know, there is no, uh, there, there is no economic reason, for instance, to build a steel mill in Georgia, but Soviet Union built a steel mill in Georgia, just to make it uh, industrialized, you see what I mean? And, and Khrushchev, uh, I think, was it in 1956? I can't now remember the exact date, but he complains in Moscow to the, to the party committee and says, why they are still following this nationalist uh, old, you know, uh, an ideology of capitalist era? We, men we, we uh, elevated the economic system to a different level, and now they are, they are, they are following these archaic ideas. Uh, although we transferred the country from a peasant country to an industrial country. So this economic determinism made them falsely conclude that nations would disappear or nationalism would disappear once the Soviet society moved to, a, to another, um, uh, another economic system. I want to I interject briefly again is that this, this is so important to me because we have people always try to indict the Soviet Union and Lenin, Leninism, and we have to give props to Trotsky. We have to understand that there was no country that had given a model of operationalizing Marxism before the Soviet Union. 
Marxism would be a dead theory in books if it was not for the Soviet Union. So for all our friends on the quote unquote sock dem or socialist left who who poo poo Marxist Leninism, who poo poo Stalin, who poo poo the Soviet Union, let us make this clear that it is the existence of the Soviet Union and this attempt to operationalize Marxism that makes the light that Marxism is implementable in Cuba, in Africa, in South America, all over the global South that use Marxist Leninist tactics in China Mm -hmm. to make socialism even alive and possible in today's world. And this is why one of the main reasons I despise when I see people take such an antagonistic tone towards Marxist Leninists. I think that's why it's important also to understand the, uh, 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 the, the correct things and the mistakes uh, the Soviet uh, uh, model uh, had. I mean, the, you see what I mean? The, uh, you, you are, I completely agree with you. They, do not ha- they did not have a blueprint uh, uh, a, a, a pl- plan uh, how to do things. There was just a bunch of theory uh, written by Western European philosophers, and they ended up in a, uh, in a very uh, under developed territory trying to do something out of that right but not then, to mention uh, not to mention as much hate that stalin gets and yes he did crimes desaline did crimes two cent did crimes he took a backwater peasant country in less than a decade to create it, an imperial superpower that mm. challenged the most greatest capitalist country in the world which was the united states but yeah but also at the same time he, his his political his political and military leadership left the Soviet Union vulnerable to a terrible uh, invasion. We, sh- we, the Soviet and he Union, de- and he defeated the Nazis. But he didn't defeat the Nazis. If you look at the, if you look at most wow, stories, now, now Stalin didn't defeat the Nazis. Really? No, the it Rus- was the, the it Russians was the, didn't defeat the Nazis. It was the oh, so you think it's like just because St- Stalin's political leadership was a bane rather than a boon? You had the officer corps trained in uh, trained Here that was go. purged. That was purged by he, Stalin, and who they was had the to bring Russia when the Russians they had the Nazis. To, they had to bring them back. They had to bring back. Who, uh, who were the who was the leader of the of the Soviet Union when the Russians beat the Nazis? Gene, it's irrelevant. It's if you it's look, irrelevant, really? Yes, it's, it's irrelevant. irrelevant. It's, it's irre- irrelevant that Stalin was leader of the Soviet Union when they beat the Nazis. Well, it's it, yeah, because basically his leadership was more of a damage to the Soviet war effort than it was go. a boon. But this is just factual. The, the this is just a factual assessment of the, the strongest yeah, effect. Guys, it's for say we can come to the Second World War, but I want just want to add uh, one last thing about uh, the perception of national like, the national question, nationality question by the uh, Bolsheviks, uh, beginning of the you know after the revolution and beginning of the 1920s uh, uh, and I, I, I genuinely enjoy uh, the discussion as well uh, I should admit that um, uh, they uh, be, be, as I mentioned in theory nations would disappear once the society moved from capitalism to socialism but while waiting for this magical moment in a way uh, they had to exhaust national identities by accelerating the historical, uh, formations of these uh, identities. You see what I mean. So they saw uh, this issue as a uh, as something they cannot rid of. That's why it was like a driving car without fa- with failed brakes. So they could not stop the car. So the best thing to do, best alternative, was to accelerate the car in order to run out of the fuel as pu- as soon as possible. That's why uh, Bolsheviks actually uh, one of the biggest nation builders in history. Uh, they are not the only ones. I mean, um, um, builders of modern national identities. We we, we have uh, all around the world. Gene uh, um, knows Middle Eastern cases, uh, um, of course. Uh, uh, in Eastern Europe, we have many. From Finland to Iran. Uh, from France to Russia, modern national identities uh, were constructed since 19th century up in, and well into 19th, 20th century, uh, gradually in different geographies, one after another. And in the Soviet case, the Bolshevik party 
uh, at the beginning, a Marxist party, an internationalist party, ended up building national identities in 1920s, 30s, 40s uh, onwards. Uh, I can go into more detail there, uh, what they did and uh, how the, the policy evolved in time. Um, but the, the main logic behind it was, as I said, uh, uh, they thought they are driving a car without, with failed brakes. And as they could not stop nationalism, they thought, let's accelerate it so that we can um, run out of, uh, the nationalism can run out of fuel. Uh, and in this way, we can stop the car of nationalism or national identities, and we will have an internationalist, uh, an international identity, which is, which has the, which is like the accumulation of human culture uh, <clears throat> beyond or above nation or nation or national cultures and identities. Let's not also forget the intellectual con intellectual contribution of Stalin formulating and formalizing Marxist Leninist thought and making it operational on the international stage as well. What a lot of bullshit. Yeah. I'm sorry. That that oh. is just bullshit because if you look at the policies of the uh, of was there the, was there Marxist Leninism as an international theory before Stalin? I mean, Trotsky was developing. Was there Marxist Leninist international? So what? Like so, Stalin? if you look at what the doctrine of Stalinism had, it, it was a two-stage revolution theory. If it, if Mao had not gone against the advice of the Soviet Union, there would have been no revolution in China. If the communist that's not, parties, that's, that's a that, well, no, argument, Gene. no, that's no, a no that's not a straw argument. man argument because the the two-stage revolution theory, which Stalin brought back, the central argument of Leninist principles was that you take the revolutionary opportunity when you have it, whereas no the one Soviets... was talking about Leninist Ask principles. Ask Al, Leninist if you don't let him finish, I will mute you. I will mute you. You have to let people finish. This isn't your house, and you can't yell over people. That's not what we do here. You I have just, to let him finish. I just, I strongly disagree with uh, this kind of cult of personality around Stalin to believe that Stalin... Stalin transformed the Third International into an instrument of Soviet foreign policy. And in general, around the world, he supported not communist movements, but left nationalist movements. And, you know, he there were all kinds of mistakes, including the foundation of the State of Israel, which was a, 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 a product of Stalinist foreign policy. We look at the Chinese Revolution, the idea of the United Front. Uh, which almost led to the liquidation of the Chinese Communist Party, not entirely Stalin's fault, but this, uh, the, this transformation of the Third International into an instrument of foreign policy. Why this happened is understandable, because the Soviet Union had to protect itself as a great power. But I don't think we need to put Stalin up on a pedestal uh, for, frankly, uh, basically not doing a great job in the third world, doing a lot of rhetoric, doing a lot of rhetoric for, for uh, and if you look at the anti-colonial struggles, a lot of the support was given post Stalin's era. So I think, I think uh, we need to, uh, I think we need to have a little bit more of a nuanced perspective on Stalin. The strongest argument I think in favor of Stalin is however bad the industrialization process was, it was a necessary requirement and it created an industrial base that the Soviet Union needed to fight Nazi Germany. That's the strongest argument I can find in favor of Stalin. Beyond that, I think there's a lot of political and ideological mistakes which had long-term effects on uh, the struggle for socialism in parts of the world outside, like Stalin sold out the Iranian revolutionaries after the end of the First uh, Second World War. Uh, Stalin liquidated indigenous communist movements across uh, Central Europe. And ultimately, the system... The system that established by uh, the system. Hold on for collapsed. one second, Gene. Hold on for one second. That's it. That's all I'm going to say. Why are you so? Why are you having a hissy fit? Why are you mad? Because you don't have anything to say. No, I have a lot of things to say. Did, just... did, did 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 Stalin liquidate indigenous communist movements? Yes or no? There wouldn't be black communists in America today if it wasn't for Stalin. I knew you were going to say that it was Stalin that had the leader of the 
of the uh, was the African and, and he was labor one of the, and You know why? You know why? Because, because he, he, he knew Trotsky. Because he knew Trotsky. And he, because he didn't agree with the Black Belt thesis that would have given Black people operational autonomy over their own that, land look, in the South. Look, he liquidated people he didn't like. So, and you, you, know have to people, stop. you know how many people? You know how many people? Stop with the you know how many people. Your in the boy French Revolution, people in the he didn't French like. Revolution during the Red during the Reign of Terror, ten thousand uh-huh. French uh-huh. people were assassinated. Did Stalin still kill that dude? Okay. Did you, Stalin still kill that dude? Did Stalin still kill that dude? About six thousand French people. Hey, hey. You forgot. Did Stalin still kill that dude? <laughs> okay. Um, now, uh, I do, because, like, this can all happen uh, elsewhere, right? You know, like, we all know each other. We all got our numbers. Uh, there's not so many Everybody, times. Everybody, look. look. We just, can I, there's not so much times we have uh, a historian on to actually talk these things through. So maybe we just put this on pause for a bit. I think there's one thing. That is undeniable. Stalin is obviously top three in sexiest, uh, <laughs> you know, communist. No disagreement so with it. No I don't, like, with I that. mean, can we can we just jump from that point and actually maybe get back to the focal? Um, and I, I I do kind of even have a question too, as far as like what the projects were for the USSR. Um, Haroon, if you can <laughs> speak to what did these some of these projects look like with nation buildings, so maybe we can interrogate the good, bad, and or different of whoever the leader was of the USSR at that time. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, exactly. The um, the nationalities issue, like um, uh, the Bolsheviks, of course, uh, as as we already uh, discussed, uh, they uh, they understood the importance of nationalities, national identities, and they were that in let's say they were not in Japan, right? There wasn't there wasn't one ethno linguistic group in the country. There were literally more than a hundred uh, uh, different ethno linguistic groups, and uh, initially. Um, um uh, the uh, these na- ethnolinguistic groups national identities uh, were promoted at all levels uh, uh, i can i can divide them into three groups um first one is uh, russian national identity if you think about it actually modern russian national identity there is a nice uh, academic literature on this as well uh, is a product of uh, 1930s um, because uh, before the Bolsheviks, the imperial identity uh, dominated uh, the discourse uh, around the monarchy, uh, you know, the, like the British uh, identity, let's say, uh, 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 vis-a-vis English identity, ethno-linguistic identity. You see what I mean? Uh, so um, in, the, in the Russian Empire, Russian imperial identity um, uh, uh, was in a, a, a competing course with the um, Russian national identity, emerging Russian, modern Russian national identity and limiting it. Once the Russian imperial identity removed, um, the, the, uh, in the, especially in, after 1936, uh, the Bolsheviks uh, encouraged the uh, further development of modern Russian identity. For instance, um, um, the, the Ivan, Ivan the Terrible. Ivan the Terrible was not a popular figure among uh, uh, peasants. I mean, he wasn't considered as a national figure. Uh, that was the promotion of the Soviet uh, literature, Soviet uh, internal, let's say, propaganda or cultural products um, <clears throat> that turned Ivan the Terrible into a national leader, uh, is into a national hero in history. So Russian history was written. Russian history was written um, in a national frame, in a national framework, not in an imperial, uh, this in an imperial discourse, but in a in a in a national sense, a modern national identity, in order to build a national identity. Um, and also non-Russian uh, identities were encouraged in parallel. Uh, that's the contradictory of Russia, uh, Soviet uh, policies, actually. So Georgians, Azerbaijanis, Armenians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Kazakhs, Uzbeks, everyone had to have their own history, on uh, cu- uh, you know cu- culinary cuisine, uh, cu- national cu- cuisine, uh, national uh, tapestry, national uh, outfits, national uh, music, 
these things actually experience, uh, for instance, in Eastern Europe uh, or in uh, uh, in Middle East as well, uh, in Hungary, in uh, Poland, in Germany, you know, in Romania, Greece, and so forth. Um, uh, if you look at the history of classical music, for instance, you will find uh, uh, composers uh, uh, that are taking classical music, merging it with uh, national, uh, let's say not national, actually ethnic uh, um, uh, motifs and uh, c- uh, developing a national classical music school. Uh, in Hungary, Bartok, in in um, in, um, in Poland, for instance, Chopin. Um, in in Russia, the beginning was uh, Tchaikovsky, for instance, uh, taking uh, Russian uh, ethnic village uh, pe- peasant motifs, uh, folk songs, uh, right, uh, and then uh, using those uh, motifs in classical music. So, uh, in in uh, in Soviet period. All nations were encouraged to experience the same uh, path of development, like Hachaturian, for instance, famous uh, Armenian uh, uh, classical music composer, Soviet Armenian classical music composer, I should uh, emphasize, Soviet and Armenian. He uh, uh, composed uh, uh, famous pieces taking Armenian folk elements and merging them uh, uh, using them in classical music. You can find the same process in Turkey, 1930s, 40s, 50s. You can find the same process in Germany in an earlier period. Uh, uh, or or uh, Grimm uh, Brothers, for instance, like the, you know, the, uh, f- collecting folk tales and labeling them as national stories, uh, sto- uh, national literature. Hey, can you um, possibly, I guess, speak to the, I guess, like the successors, successes and or failures of that type of nation building model, where you are taking historical and cultural, you know, either history or just folk tales, and and then you know, I guess, building off the cultural narrative and building their own nationality out of that. How you know, I guess. Good, bad, and different. If there's uh, examples of well, such. Well, well, um, the, the, I think it it was uh, it was successful because uh, it uh, still survived after 1991. You see, in Afghanistan, for instance, uh, the most powerful country in history, with the most powerful army, the the you know, biggest military budget, biggest economy, the, the superior of all couldn't build a nation state in 20 years, although they invested uh, billions of dollars, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. The Soviet case from Uzbekistan to Georgia to, uh, I can include Ukraine and Russia itself, as I said, uh, modern national identities were, uh, construction of modern national identities were taken very seriously. Uh, Unification and homogenization of language, for instance, because um, in Ukraine or in Russia, there were different dialects. Uh, uh, um, in 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 Georgia, uh, I mean, we take these things granted, and we uh, and we think that languages, national languages, are homogeneous. No, they are not. Uh, until 19th century, there wasn't a, a one language, one homogeneous language that everyone spoke and understood. In Italy, for instance, uh, different regions could not understand each other. Uh, mm-hmm. Italians know it better than me, of course. So. Um, these things are method systematically done and institutionalized, like uh, uh, in each republic, an institution of history, an institution of language uh, and literature, uh, uh, institution of, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, ethnography <clears throat> were opened. Experts were uh, uh, trained. They went to villages. They collected materials from uh, um, different regions, and then they syst- they created a systematic uh, knowledge structure. They wrote history books for each republic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when you look at in uh, Africa, for instance, um, uh, in post-colonial Africa or post-colonial um, uh, or uh, recent case Afghanistan, of course, we all know now what's going on there. Um, 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 uh, that also brings us to this discussion if Soviet Union was a colonial power uh, a, 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 uh, for non-Russians in the Soviet 
Union. You see, there is a there is a why uh, Cold War uh, discussion uh, uh, like that. So um, if you if you if you see the 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 difference uh, is very clear uh, because uh, uh, the Soviet case was in a way uh, state driven rapid modernization. Uh, um, uh, the, the the Soviet administration uh, uh, they basically wanted to uh, have a rapid modernization and industrialization. Uh, but if you have antagonisms among different ethnic groups, different national identities, discontent, people killing each other, uh, there is constantly a c- potential civil war between different ethnicities. You cannot rule a country, let alone build a water dam, let alone build a steel mill, let alone build thousands of kilometers of railways, because you want an Armenian engineer, a Georgian uh, constructor, uh, I don't know, a a Turkmen uh, peasant uh, producing the bread for those uh, industrial workers, work in tandem, work it together in a bigger project. So if you cannot uh, satisfy uh, these needs of different ethnicities and nationalities, you cannot uh, run uh, uh, this this project. You cannot uh, develop the country further, right? Because this is the, this is the legacy they had uh, um, before the Soviet rule. Uh, in many regions of the Russian Empire, people killed each other. I mean, in the Caucasus, for instance, Armenians and um, Azerbaijanis, Muslims, they, uh, they, 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 there, was a, there were more than one civil wars there in, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. So you say to the people who killed each other, like in recent civil wars, like in Yugoslavian civil war, you see what I mean, the, the uh, Syrian civil war. So you say that, you all different ethnicities, now we will come together and build a big house. How can you do that? If you can create a peace among different ethnic groups to Which, satisfy wanna, their I wanna, needs. I want to interject for a moment, please. I want to address this. I didn't mean to yell at Gene, but I want this is very important to me, and I want a dispensation here. I am not a, a Stalinist by any stretch of the imagination, but I recognize and acknowledge that Stalin is undermined because he basically did the extremes of revolution that in every revolution has happened. In France, again, as I mentioned, 10,000 citizens were murdered for the French Revolution. In the United States, after the glorious revolution here, not to mention that they kept slaving, Andrew Jackson massacred thousands of Native Americans to keep the American revolutionary flag alive. Jean-Jacques Dessalines murdered thousands of white Frenchmen to keep the integrity of his country. In revolutions, when you're challenging against whatever force of oppression you think, people get massacred. That's what happens in revolutions. And to somehow single out Stalin as some kind of incompetent or some kind of horrible man because he did exactly what the Americans did, what the French did, what the Haitians did, what every revolution Derry does, kill people he's afraid are opposed to the larger project, excuse me, is ridiculous. And it's a, it's a fault on the left, whether you like Stalinism or Marxist-Leninism or not, because it's ahistorical co- compared to what actually happens in any revolution. And one of the reasons why I actually do defend Stalin is the same way he's erased from history is exactly what the West and the world has done to Jean-Jacques Dessalines for 200 years, which most people don't even know. He was the only one interested in an independent Haiti because Toussaint Louverture always wanted to be a house Negro for the French till his dying day, but because he massacred French opposition in his country, he is considered a black sheep, To even to the point when my father was growing up, it was an embarrassment for our family to say that we were actually related to Jean-Jacques de Salines. That's how bad it got in that country. And to treat Stalin as some kind of black sheep of socialism is ridiculous and ignorant. Uh, uh, thank you, Pascal, for 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 sharing your opinion. I I I I, um, uh, I, I wanted to add uh, something else to what I said uh, about this uh, national uh, nationalities policy because uh, if I don't add it, uh, the you know the other half, one half, I I said the uh, certain aspects, but then 
I did did not cover yet the uh, other uh, aspects that uh, that that will uh, complete the uh, picture. Uh, the the uh, the <clears throat> as I said, this uh, encouragement of uh, Russian and non-Russian identities went hand in hand until 1936, which included also smaller ethnic groups like gypsies, for instance, right? So, uh, or um, or uh, the Kurdish population in the Caucasus um, uh, that I uh, wrote an article about, um, because there was this uh, three layers of identities in Soviet Union. One was the Soviet identity, the civic identity, like the American identity, non-ethnic identity, right? The Soviet identity. Uh, and then we had the... Uh, uh, the identities, national identities with um, union republics, like Russian identity, Ukrainian identity, uh, Uzbek identity, that uh, in 1922, they gained a Republican status, like they had their own republic within the Federation. And then we had smaller groups like um, 100,000, 200,000, 500,000, 10,000, 20,000 populations, right? Very small. Uh, Udis, for instance, in the Caucasus, like a few thousands. Uh, so in 1920s, until up until 1936, there is a consistent policy of promoting identities at three levels simultaneously, right? Mm. Minus Russian. Russian was the Russian identity was the bad guy, <laughs> uh, the former oppressor identity that's why that was the main potential threat that was the main uh, source uh, considered as the main source of reactionary forces that's why russian identity until 1936 was in a way uh, you know a kind of a, a naughty child that you say go and stand at the corner of the classroom like uh, the russian identity was per perceived like this <laughs> The rest, the rest was like encouraged to uh, enjoy the life. Uh, now, I, I got, I got to say, especially after you, as you describe that, I see some comparisons to like the federalism model of the United States, except it's just more of like a strict, you know, politic and you know, government dynamic versus like a cultural aspect that is like uh, in the, in the well. US the borders are administrative borders uh, are, they have nothing to do with ethnic identities that was also an important discussion at the beginning when the Soviet Union was formed because there was a group in the party seriously co uh, co um, uh, 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 said that we um, um, uh, we should design the new state according to economic needs, the administrative units, the borders, internal borders of the country should be drawn according to economic needs. For instance, Petersburg is a big port and industrialized cent industry center, right? So we should have a region of Petersburg and its hinterland, regardless the ethnic groups within this territory. Like there can be Finns, Russians, whatever, who are living there, we don't care. The borders should be designed, internal borders, according to the economic needs, big eco industrial economic centers and their hinterland around that. Another group in the party said, no, we cannot do this because that will be denying the reality of national identities on the ground. We should draw the administrative bond boundaries, the administrative uh, delimitation had to be done according to the ethnicities or national identities we have. That's why, and the second group won the discussion, and that's why the Soviet Union, if you look at the map, the Repu Union Republic's borders are drawn according to ethno-linguistic divisions, not according to economic needs. They, they, they think about it. Like Marxists uh, ruling a country, they, sh they have, they usually, they should be putting economy and economic needs as a priority. But they say no, we will not do that. We will draw the borders, internal borders, according to ethnic um, uh, identities. Even so, to, a, to the extent that when they won the civil war during that period, for instance, they uh, after right after in 1920-21, they uh, the Red Army entered today's Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia, and the, those three republics, which were 
like uh, uh, there was an inter there was a short period in one two years they were uh, independent uh, when they became part of the Soviet Union Bolsheviks continued to recognize more or less the borders of those countries. Um, just they, they made minor changes in order to appease everyone because everyone claimed others' uh, lands. <laughs> so it was impossible to uh, appease everyone, make everyone happy. They did their best uh, just to balance, uh, you know, three different nations in one region. Again, in order to make everyone happy so that everyone hand in hand could develop the country because country had to be ready for a rapid industrialization and modernization. So, but ni- after 1936, the policy changed. That's what I wanted to add. Yep. Um, after 1936, Russian national identity uh, encouraged as other national identities um, be- be- for various reasons. And uh, after the Second World War, Russian national identity became even more dominant vis-a-vis other national identities. So the Soviet period is not a one-color uh, story. Uh, it There are minimum three or four different stages because the river of history flows so fast in that 70 years. So many things are happening one after another and very radical decisions always uh, were taken one after another. You know, uh, If you look at that, each lead Soviet leader wanted to reform the previous, uh, change the previous uh, leader's epoch like uh, decision. So, um, so there are different stages. After 1947, uh, we have more uh, Russian identity, the Russian national identity becoming more dominant. This doesn't mean that other nations were Russified, forced to be Russian. That was impossible, and everyone knew that. I mean, uh, that would create antagonism and uh, reaction. Um, The Russian language in 1930s became uh, prominent for economic and military reasons. Uh, There are uh, archive materials around this discussion. I mean, Stalin and the other leading uh, members of the Politburo and uh, Central Committee, they discuss. I mean, it seems uh, like an easy, like just a, an easy scale upward of what they were doing regionally, you know, like within, you know, specific, you know, nations that they were trying to build, like you said, like normalizing one na- language is a benefit to, you know, collectivizing that, that, that identity within the borders. But I guess what you're saying too, is also that like, there wasn't a forceful like spread of Russian, um, I guess the Russian cultural narrative, but however, there was like the. I mean, we were saying that um, just, I guess, advised to, you know, I guess, broaden some cultural narrative, start speaking Russian just for the ease of the development of the overall project. I mean, yes, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah co- co- correct. You are right. The, the, for instance, a, a, a timber factory in Siberia producing timber. Right. And then there is a, a furniture factory in, uh, let's say, in Odessa. Right. So uh, and there is a railway transportation network uh, uh, connecting these two. So timber factory manager and the producer, uh, timber producer is there, uh, should speak or the same language or the, write in the same language in the documents, record things, uh, accountancy, finance or transportation of the timber, raw material to the factory in another republic where they speak another language. Um, when the economy developed gradually in 1930s, when the industrialization, urbanization took off, you know, um, a, a common lang- necessity of a common language appeared. That's the economic reason. Otherwise, how can you connect different uh, production point lines and transportation system, agriculture, industry? It's impossible. Um, even you cannot do accountancy uh, without a single language. But there's also a military aspect of this. After 1933, when Hitler came to power, Soviet leadership was uh, uh, day and night. They start to think about uh, 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 the war uh, that was uh, coming towards them. Uh, they, they, they had 
Uh, you see the Spanish Civil War and so on, um, <clears throat> the, the Italian intervention in Africa, uh, J Japanese expansion in Asia in 1930s. So actually war for the Soviet uh, leadership, war did not start in 1939. The war started much earlier for the Soviet leadership. They, they perceived these signals and the whole system was uh, geared, restructured, prepared for the start. They start to prepare the whole country. Actually, decisions. When you look at this, certain decisions they made, they made the, the the investment in military industry and so on. You see, uh, there is no there is no doubt about that. There is no cool question about that. They they know they have a perception of war coming towards them like a truck. And they have to be ready. One of the discussions was around, the, again, Russian language. Uh, that I tried to explain the economic reason, um, but there's also a military reason. Um, even during the Second World War, uh, it, many Red Army soldiers, non-Russian Red Army soldiers, did not know Russian. So can you imagine you are a drilling officer a uh, drilling sergeant or uh, you are a commander, uh, a colonel in front of 1,000 people. Half of them don't know uh, uh, Russian. You say turn right, the half of them turns left. <laughs> How can you win a war? How can you run a, a military uh, system like this? You see, uh, it, and this was discussed. I mean, because there were even national uh, military units within the Red Army. Um, up until 1930s, in 1920s, uh, and and uh, no language was uh, forbidden. I mean, each individual, even if you were a member of 10,000 Udi ethnic group that no one knows, you are were entitled to have a translator at the court. You have a, a right to uh, have a textbook. In reality. You wouldn't have a textbook because there wouldn't be enough money or educated, uh, you know, um, people probably to write a textbook, a, a, a geometry book in Udi language. But on paper, at least, you had a solid guarantee until 1936. But after that, uh, the two things happened. One of them is this prioritization of Russian language in order to uh, parallel to this economic integration and preparation for the war. And the second is um, 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 this ethnophilia uh, came to an end, as historians of Soviet Union usually call it, ethnophilia. Only re the national identities which, has, uh, na um, rep which uh, have republics, like in Azerbaijan, only Azerbaijani language will be supported, not the uh, small minorities there. In Georgia, for instance, Georgian language will be priority, uh, not other uh, small minorities there. You see, these two things happened in parallel. I got to take this super chat. We got to send a, th a shout out for sure, for sure, for sure, to Landrew Landrew with this $100 super chat. As Dr. Lou said, this is revolution is more than an entertainment podcast. It's a teaching tool. Thank you for the outstanding teaching. Shout out to Landrew Landrew for that one. That was uh Get it? now I, I got a question for the panel. If uh I think if we're if we're all good to, ready to you know, play nicely mm -hmm. with each other again, be friends, comrades. We always we're we're always know, friends. <laughs> Pascal, Pascal um, and I can have fruity conversations occasionally. Because pause, we, on the fruit, pause on the fruity. <laughs> no, I had a, I, have, I got a question though, because of dealing with these, like the the, the nation building, building, and like I guess it was like building the project and the use of culture and developing a culture within regions, um, and I think too is like as 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 someone, if someone was you know just existing. As as a peasant or some worker, and then you know people are coming and saying, "Listen, we're gonna we're actually going to help and put you as the front." That is going to be more acceptable than you know, I guess, like you'd reference the uh, United States nation building effort in Afghanistan, which horrible failure, as we can tell. Um, so, turning the question, I guess, is what lessons can we take right as you know leftists in the united states or if it's part of an international community what lessons 
I mean, I guess to the panel, do you think that we could, you know, could could take dealing with maybe some of the car, cult, different cultural narratives that uh, exist within the United States um, and possibly tie that to some type of movement that would be useful in a way that wouldn't be so, I guess, um, yeah, that, that, that wouldn't be so different than what they already exist in, the cultural narrative that they already exist in. Lesson number one, the world is worse off without the Soviet Union. And I'm not joking, because if there was a serious socialist counter hedron in the world, in the, if there was a serious socialist counter hedron in the world, like during the Cold War, that threatened the United States to basically end Jim Crow, that threatened the United States to democratize uh, the, the world, its, its population by importing immigrants from other countries and other colors as well, if there was a serious soldier, socialist counter hegemon in the world that was ideological, unlike China, then we could actually have an internationalist social, socialist project like the Common Turn that might be worth something. I mean, I don't disagree. I think the existence of the Soviet Union was an important counterbalance on uh, U.S. Uh, political power, and it's generally good for peoples in the developing world. And I, I've discussed this off air with Harun before. It's generally good for people to have different options uh, in the world rather than having to rely on the Washington consensus. We saw what happened in the 90s and 2000s when the United States' military power was unchallenged. We saw not only the imposition of the neoliberal political order through uh, tools and mechanisms, uh, uh, you know, uh, diplomatic and, and fiscal tools and mechanisms, but the war on terror would not have been able to have taken place. There would have been, you know, uh, uh, if it had, if there hadn't been for uh, the, you know, if there'd been a counter hegemon. I mean, like, look at Russia today. It's not like Russia today is some kind of paradise compared to how it was in in the Soviet period. You have basically the pauperization of the country, the 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 looting of its industrial uh, capacity, and the transformation of Russia into an oligarchy. Uh, you know, we, which relies primarily on 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 uh, um, uh, natural resources like petroleum uh, and an arms industry that is uh, left over from the Soviet period. So, you know, I don't want people in the chat to get uh, get the wrong idea that my critique of Stalin and, and the Soviet Union come uh, is a uh, is like the so Soviet Union bad. I have specific critiques of that historical project. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I think the collapse of the Soviet Union was generally positive for the global system, because I do not think it was, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think it was a positive development. Um, because now we have an international system which has, has been more dangerous in many ways, in many parts of the third world than during, during, the, cold, uh, during the Cold War era. We have a military power of the United States that is completely unchecked. And we have a Russia and a post-Soviet world where, yes, a couple of countries on the edge that got into the European Union have benefited, but the vast majority of the population in the Soviet Union, a former Soviet Union, has not benefited. You look at Central Asia, you look at the Caucasus, you look at Russia, uh, you know, you have like a, a society which is in health collapse, in economic collapse, you have alcoholism and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, I think, uh, I think we have to, uh, I think we have to, I, my position is just to take a nuanced view on, on, on the history of the Soviet Union. Uh, I, I, I want to add a few things, actually. These are very important points, guys, you are, you are uh, touching like they, they are so important. And, you know, the things we discuss uh, might the things we discuss might sound a bit like history uh, <laughs> I mean it's history but there are always uh, consequences uh, uh, and there are always uh, repercussions there are always uh, uh, you know uh, 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 connections to what we experience nowadays for instance the Soviet nation building uh, project and vis-a-vis -vis Af what happened in Afghanistan right um, um, the one thing I want to add is um, um, uh, to my mind, um, uh, when we look at this nationality issue in Soviet Union, after a point, Russian national identity, 
Russian nationalism gradually started to uh, hijack the Soviet project, internationalist project. And on top of that, uh, other national identities also start to uh, drag the Union in different directions. So by the by 1970s, first the Russian, of course, national identity, after the victory, after the military victory, because many Russians thought that this has happened to thanks to them, not to because of Ukrainians, Georgians, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, and so on. Uh, numerically, they suffered the most, they sacrificed the most, uh, and they thought this is this is a this is a long journey started since the Peter the Great modernization of Russia. We always follow the West. Now our army marching in Berlin. We are the victorious, and thanks to Russians, this happened. Many Russians thought like this. And actually, in Stalin's period, um, uh, the last purge, physically uh, purging people, killing, sh shooting people, happened in order to uh, uh, remove some Russian, uh, some, some politicians in Leningrad accused for being Russian nationalists. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a long story. If you want, I can give a bit more detail. But that was the last time in 1946-47 when uh, during the Stalinist period, uh, a, a secret police uh, shot people uh, for political reasons. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking about sending exile continued, but shooting people, killing people uh, for political reasons happened because... Uh, they were accused uh, for harboring uh, Russian nationalism. This is very ironic because now today, Russian fascist groups, fa Russian nationalists, bikers, uh, by, uh, motorcyclists, uh, there's a fascist group like this, uh, uh, like a kind of a skinhead slash biker slash uh, with a fascist ideology uh, wandering in Russia. Uh, they go and pay respect at uh, Rus uh, at Stalin's uh, <laughs> grave in uh, Kremlin, seeing it as a Russian victorious general and uh, f founding father of modern Russia, which is of course, if Stalin probably came back, he would uh, definitely shoot them as well. But because uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, uh, they accused Stalin of being a Russian nationalist, well, you're saying Stalin was actually anti-Russian nationalist project. You're saying that he was antagonistic to the concept of Russian nationalism. He he saw nations. Uh, national identities as an instrument. He was not a Georgian or Russian nationalist. He saw them as a as an existing fact, and in order to mobilize people, tools that can be used temporarily, but not as a as a um, like a, um, a, a means to achieve a goal. Not the goal itself. He was a, because a nationalist would perceive national identity or nationalism as an ideology, uh, a, 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 as a means and a, and a goal to achieve. But for Stalin, it was a it was just a reality of life that he he, he had to uh, in a way accommodate and use it for the uh, for 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 his own goals. Uh, Doctor, let me ask you. This is a very important question. I want to ask you. Do you believe that Stalin actually truly believed? in the socialist revolution internationally, or he was just more interested in acquiring power on his own terms? Yeah, that's, that's. Uh, I think in the short term, he didn't believe. In the long term, he believed. That's the dichotomy. He said uh, one Soviet tractor is much better than 10 foreign socialists. There was a reason for that. The 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 the, uh, the the explanation of that sentence is: we need to build first industry here, so that we can think about a, a global perspective later. Otherwise, without an economic base, we cannot do anything. Uh, so, uh, so that's why my question would be: he wouldn't he didn't believe in a, a world revolution in the short term because he didn't see any material means for that. But he his idea of a world revolution in a distance 
uh, still he he kept he kept it, uh, it but in a in a long term uh, idea not overnight uh, uh, connecting this to China actually uh, I now I'm I'm uh, sometimes I think like uh, is China experiencing a 1947 moment uh, mm-hmm. as someone who studied Soviet Union because um, uh, I'm I'm pretty sure there are millions of people in China uh, and they're right uh, to believe so they say they probably say, we uh, elevated 800 million people f- uh, from mm-hmm. uh, poverty, and World Bank reports recognize this. And this population equals to sub-Saharan, sub-Saharan Africa. You know, if you if you uh, deduct the, the Mediterranean coast population of Africa, the whole continent is 850 million. So we have managed to lift the same amount of people in China within 25 years from desperate poverty to a level where they can have access to clean water, sewer system, free education, free health service, healthcare service, while in the last half a century in a whole con- continent, there wasn't any such achievement, right? So they can say, uh, who did it? Now, there are two answers to that <laughs> question. One, co- one answer is Communist Party did it. The ideology did it. Mm-hmm. And the other qu- answer is Chinese people did it, which can mm-hmm. be easily translated into easily Chinese nation did it. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, not the Chinese toiling masses, but the Chinese nation did it, which can slide very easily from a left-wing discourse to a right-wing discourse. This is what, this mm-hmm. is what happened in Soviet Union. Uh, that's why after 1947, Russian national identity became something that party officials also recognize as a fact. I mean, like, uh, we cannot fight against this. We will embrace this, right? Okay, we will not turn Azerbaijanis or Georgians into Russians, but we will give Russians a, a first among equal place. Mm-hmm. Isn't this the isn't this the contradiction? You know, the contradiction between the notion of uh, socialism in one country. On one hand, socialism in one country is a entirely logical, uh, logical political uh, stance, given the failure of revolutions to break out in other parts of the world and the international isolation of the Bolshevik Revolution. But at the same time, as you're saying, it creates that pressure that increasingly forces the communist leadership to focus on internal development, not only ignoring external revolution, but at times actually hampering external revolution because of the necessities of having, you know, of protecting the revolution at home. So you need to make a deal to get the oil from the Shah. Well, you know, it would be nice to have a socialist revolution in uh, Iran, but if the Shah will make the uh, deal with us, we need that oil. So we end up with this kind of contradiction. And I think, especially, I, I completely agree with you. Sorry for interrupting. Until 1960s, I think this is the mentality of the Soviet leadership. Uh, the 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 uh, the elites that did the, made the revolution and this, uh, you know the, uh, Stalin and his group later on uh, successful uh, within the internal party power struggle, uh, they have always had this uh, siege mentality. They always thought that we are under siege. We have to. We constantly have to protect, and we have to be defensive. Uh, we we have to consolidate our uh, defense barriers. But after 19, uh, 1950s, 60s, when Soviet Union reached a certain level of uh, economic development, uh, especially later Khrushchev years and Brezhnev period, then you see, for instance, Soviet agencies being more active in Africa, in Latin America, uh, th- th- because they had more kind of self confidence. You know, we are not like uh, a revolutionaries. Uh, founded themselves accidentally in an agricultural society, now turning it into a, a European philosopher's uh, idea, uh, based on European philosopher idea, you know, something uh, magical. Uh, and at, everyone is attacking, as you said, American troops in the north, Japanese and British and French in the south and so on. So that, uh, because the civil war period shaped the mm, mm, uh, minds of these people, the civil war period, 
it was a very bloody civil war. Millions of people perished. Believe me, it was a very, I mean, the, if you have, have you ever seen the pictures of Syria, uh, recent pictures like the mm-hmm. destroyed cities and towns and so on? Exactly the same thing happened in Russia within three years. The revolution, it was bloodless in the uh, October revolution, but the subsequent civil war for three years was so destructive that Soviet economy reached 1913 levels only in 1927. So they needed seven years to rebuild the country and reach to the production levels of the pre-war level, uh, the pre-First World War level. So these people experienced the civil war and they had this civil war mentality. They had they had this um, uh, defensive, uh, protective uh, mentality, right? So we need tractors. Okay, perhaps there can be a revolution in France, but our priority is to have first Soviet tractors. Only after 1960s, with a self-confident Soviet, new self-confident uh, Soviet generation, uh, which was brought up during the uh, 1930s and 40s, which experienced the victory, which experienced the Red Army marching in Berlin and so on, which experienced the atomic bomb, possession of the atomic bomb and so on. So they uh, felt like, okay, now we can send a delegation to Ghana and help them uh, with their uh, water dam uh, construction. Mm-hmm. Okay, we can now send doctors to, I don't know, Central Asia, uh, African Republic and uh, help them with irrigation systems or clean water, uh, you know, uh, pipe mm-hmm. pipes and so on. It 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 it's a di- there are the two different epochs, two different people, two different generations. If you look in terms of Soviet history. Uh, Excellent. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, discussions around Soviet Union happens when we uh, pick up a certain aspect or a certain decade uh, Mm. within this long 70 years. Actually, there are many nuances. There are changing policies, contradictory policies, one after another. Very sharp U-turns sometimes based on the con- uh, of the conditions of the time, um, and um, it's it's usually better to see a bigger picture uh, and to see these continuities and discontinuities uh, and judge the period based on that. Otherwise, uh, uh, picking a certain aspect, certain period, certain decade uh, might uh, mislead us. Uh, and we might have uh, wrong lessons from a Soviet experience in that sense. Well, okay. before, before we go out, I'm going to make a request to Jason. I just sent him a video. I want to ask him if we can go out to this video. I think it will be a very good to go out for uh, for this subject matter. It's a video that I find very inspirational. So, Jason, are uh, you hmm. are you doing a neck neck massager right now? Oh yes, I am. Okay, you got the neck massager. Well, Harun, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you will come back to talk more. We 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 only scratched the surface today. Can so so we can go deeper into this. We I, can go well, I, I you know like that's the, like if it would be okay if the panel would indulge me. I I, I want to ask the question though. It's like, what is the usefulness of some of the topics that we discuss today to our current goals in you know? the United States and internationally, you know, is there anything or uh, are we just getting a history lesson as far as some of the cultural focus as far, you know, like is it a nation building um, or even just how we discuss historical, <laughs> you know, topics or anything like what, what we're learning that left sectarianism is stupid and we should stop banging people because they're MLs or trots or someone else. Because so we have, them, like, have sex with them. What is that? <laughs> banging them, like, nice banging. Well, we can we can we can disagree with that with with each other without trying to go full mau mau. Because even if we disagree over historical facts, we can still agree on a lot more uh, than we disagree on. And frankly, <laughs> as Pascal always says, the left is so weak. The being super sectarian about things is kind of pointless. So I am not a big Stalin fan. But I'm happy to work alongside MLs if we have a common goal because they're rather they're, they're closer to me than a reactionary fascist. 
Jason, can we go on with the video that I, I shared, please? Oh, we, can do, we can do whatever you like right now because these people's house has this massager. And they told us, <laughs> Jason, we know you had a long drive getting down here. We charged this up. Harvard, did you, your did you enjoy yourself today? I enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much uh, for for having me. I enjoyed the questions as well. They were challenging. Uh, I'm I'm so happy uh, to gather with so uh, learned uh, uh, intellectual people uh, like you. Like um, uh, as a group, uh, you uh, be, you know being a guest of a, a intellectual elite like this uh, was a privilege. Uh, thank you very much. I think he's. Are you? That, that's that's a joke, right? He's talking. Is is Doc Huron? You know? No, we we have to bring you back on. We have to bring you. Thank back you, on. thank you for coming. Thank you, Doctor Yomaz. We have to bring you back on. Thank you. Hit, hit the video, Jason, please. Hold on, brother. Hold on. That means I got to move my arm. Don't do we do we do we have to advertise next week's shows? The important shows we will be having next week. Why don't you guys advertise the next week's shows? Well, well next week, who do we have, Pascal? Thursday we'll be we will be broadcasting a uh, recorded show at Richard Wolf that we'll be doing on Tuesday, but we, we it will be recorded. It will not be a live stream. We should be should we recording. should we maybe uh, should we do it like we do the um, the patron half and and send out a, a link to patrons who want to participate in the Richard Wolf show. It's at three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, I mean, some, still, the fuck is this home? some people live in different time zones. I, mean, I told them it was going to be pre. I told them it was going to be pre-recorded, and I wouldn't want to just be like, "Okay, we're going to do a live trip." That's why I've already told them it would be pre-recorded. Okay, well, pass out but, ruined y'all fun. Just remember that. But you could send out the link. You could send out the uh, the link to the pre-record early for the patrons. You could do that. I mean, that's cool, but it'd be better that's if they were like Doctor Wolf. They can ask a question. I'm just gonna. Well, you could questions. collect up some questions <laughs> next time. Maybe next. Who's our Tuesday guest, Gene? We've got Zach Exley coming. Uh, Zach Exley also is also a student of Richard Wolf. Also a student of Richard Wolf. Yeah, as is the, another homie of the show, Doctor Asatar Bear. Yeah. So, uh, well, Jason, why do you sound like you're doing like you know the uh, what do they call it? The um, Quiet Storm, DJ the Quiet. Storm. Because right now. He sounds like the guy from the Snoop Dogg ad from. This is e- DJ Easy Dick slapping. <laughs> DJ <the>, Easy Dick. <laughs> um, no, I'll say, uh, Haroon, to, out of respect for your time, if you if you want to leave as we do this nonsense, <laughs> you, like, feel free. You, there's, there's there's no reason that you have to yes. like, subject yourself to this. <laughs> I like I'm, to hear. I like Haroon to hear the video. That's why I'm asking you to play. I'm, oh. I'm trying. I'm trying to comp my speakers. I blew my speakers, so I'm very upset. Those are the only set of speakers I have. My monitors. So I'm trying to calm myself down. And then Pascal got so mad that he had the longest string of drool come down his mouth that yes when we we're gonna do a clip we're gonna play that shit in slow motion <laughs> we're gonna animate the drool <laughs> we went so fast from like this is a great group of intellectuals What are we going to call it? Does it have a name? When Pascal put that picture up of him as a little boy, I was like, why do you think I'm not going to use this? <laughs> <laughs> the comment said that you have that same look on your face now. I had hair then. You still yeah. have hair now? Just very yeah, small. Yeah, his back and balls. <laughs> Honestly, when I like think of like young Pascal going through law school, it's exactly as I see him now, except with a kid and play haircut. <laughs> I don't know if it's true, or false, but that's just what I believe. Well, well t- talking about hair, Genie uh, uh, has two times more hair since uh, since I saw him. Uh, you know, oh, like, shots like, fired! Like, <laughs> last time, uh, basically, he said Gene got. I used attention. to have, I I, I I used to have short hair. Yeah, I used, I used to have very short hair, but uh, uh, now you, uh, I let my locks grow and my sakala 
Yeah, yeah, your Taliban sakal is also your Taliban beard is also good. Yeah. I'm, I'm ready. I should Marx. You actually you are you are getting closer to Karl Marx. Uh, you know photographs. You know those uh, pro prominent oh. ones. Uh, yeah, uh, is that what nice... you're going for, Jean? Huh? I didn't Tal think Tal it. Marx, Taliban. I was, both, I was both more going. For, I was more going for um, for uh, Laszlo from What We Do in the Dark. But okay, I'll do. It. Have you seen What We Do in the Dark? <laughs> What we do in the shadows? Sorry, yeah. What we do in the shadows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we do in the what shadows? we do in the shadows? I'm going for the Laszlo look. <laughs> bat, everybody, bat. I'm the oh, the pornography cool. was fantastic. That's my that's my Laszlo <laughs> impression. I try to do. Not bad. Not, not bad. Bat. Okay. Hold on, Pascal. I got yeah. I got the I got the thing. Hold on. Let's uh, let me share the screen. This is so comfortable. Oh Nando the Relentless. Nando the Relentless is Persian. I can't believe I have lived my life and didn't know this device existed. The that the the white dude in that the energy vampire. Oh, he's freaking amazing, jo uh, Colin Robinson. Yeah, Pascal, do you have tension in your shoulders? No, not right now. Uh, I'm gonna get you one of these for Christmas. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll I'll accept that gift. I mean, this is Bat. this is pretty amazing. It's literally it's literally amazing. yeah. You you need one of those to like keep you in in. Oh, there we go. What's this? This Paul is... Robinson singing the Soviet anthem in English. Okay. This is this is how fired up Pascal was for the show. He listened to this uh, on repeat this morning as he was brushing his teeth in front of the mirror. Just going, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm ready. Get you, motherfuckers. Say some about stuff. Well, Harun, <laughs> Monkey mouth, motherfuckers. Harun, we'll, definitely, we'll definitely have you back. Perhaps to talk about what American historians get wrong about the Soviet Union. How about that? Uh, that's a brilliant topic, I think. And, uh, how, and, and it's probably going to be a long one, too. Uh, how they wrote and rewrote uh, the Soviet history in the U.S. <laughs> and then rewriting the, it. I want to ask America. you something quickly. I just have a, I have a quick question to ask. What do you think of the books Team Stalin? Have you read that one? Team, St Team, Team Stalin? Because I like yeah, Team yeah. Stalin. Yeah. Is it called Team Stalin? I forget. Team Stalin. Smells like Team Stalin. <laughs> Team. Team Stalin. Yeah. On Team Stalin. That's what it was called. On Team Stalin. Uh, I don't know that one. Uh, oh, okay. It's sorry. it's. It's by Sheila Fitzpatrick's. Uh, uh, Fitz, Sheila Fitzpatrick's book. If, if she wrote it, uh, I would love to read it. Oh. Yeah, it was a good book. I enjoyed it. It's um, um, uh, it must be a new one then. I don't, I don't know. Is it a new, is it a new publication? Uh, okay, well, play the video. I'm trying to tell you. I'm all gonna... Fitzpatrick's books. Uh, she's a great historian. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to play this and then I'm going to actually fall asleep. W wonderful. Uh, it's always nice to hear Paul Robson. Pa beautiful voice, amazing Excellent athlete, voice. great yes. actor, yes. one and, hell of an activist. And they named the London School of Oriental and African Studies graduate halls of residence Paul Robson House. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. wow. Do we know how Paul That's... felt about Stalin? Uh, he likes he was, Stalin. He, he likes Stalin until Stalin. until the, towards the end of his life. He actually kind of pushed back on some of the things he had said. Let's not uh, let's Gerald not reopen Horn. that can of worms. Gerald Horn wrote a really great uh, biography on uh, Paul Robeson. So here we go, guys. I want to once again thank our guest. Thank you guys for the super chats. I want to thank Pascal for sending this video. I want to thank Marcus for just being you. I love you guys. And we're out. Long live our people, united and free, strong in our friendship, tried by fire, 
Long may our crimson flag inspire, shining in glory for all the men to see. Through days dark and stormy, while great Lenin led us, our eyes saw the bright sun of freedom above, and Stalin, our leader, with faith in the people, inspired us to build a land that we love.